um, as the you know fourth person to get it. Yeah, and that bumped me out, and I only had one ticket left in my pocket to try to get back in line and play. You know, took the base from you know 2022, and then made a few changes for the uh, super kill screen. And now and that we have people hitting 30 hertz on the NES controller, you almost have this aspect of like, well, does it matter that we use an NES controller anymore? Uh, Josh uh, Tolles described it like a story mode where you like you pick a player like. I want to play yeah. Jonas's tournament run. I want to play Harry's tournament run. When I invited Alex to join me on the Peace Dependency podcast, I had no idea how diverse our conversation would be. We talked about that we don't know who made NES Tetris. We talked about should we use more controllers than the original NES controller? Now Rolling has 30 hertz. And why doesn't Alex play a lot online? Well, this and more we had in the conversation. Hi, my name is Frank, also known as Sir Mazer, and today we have Alex Kitarokur on the show. Literally a walking knowledge book. It was a very fun conversation, and it's over two hours long. And a quick disclaimer before uh, we start with the interview. This interview got recorded on December the 30th, so one day before a game scout released his viral video about the Blue Scooty Game Crest. So imagine this is a world where the game crash happened for Blue Scooty and not for Fractal of Pixel Landy, and the world was quiet about it. <laughs> this is our conversation. Alex, welcome to the Peace of Fantasy podcast. Thank you so much for doing this. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. Hey, first question is always the same question to everyone who's new on a podcast, and that is how did you get into NES Tetris? Oh, um, so NES Tetris. Um, I guess, um, think back, um, the first version of Tetris I played was very early on. I, I played Game Boy Tetris when I was like, you know, three or four years old. Got a Game Boy very early on. Um, but I hadn't played Nintendo Tetris, I think, until um, maybe even like, you know, like middle school or like high school age, I guess, because I didn't have an NES growing up at a Sega Genesis. Yeah. Um, so yeah. I, I tried it a little bit and um, I had the, I guess, like what was used to be the kind of cliche um, opinion, which was, oh, there's this other version of Tetris, Tengen Tetris, you know, that's the the better version. It's got two player and things like that. So I didn't really catch on, I guess, to the um, of um, what could be found in the single player aspect of uh, NES Tetris until way later on. I was more of yeah. a uh, T TGM player at that like kind of era in my life. Um, and I didn't really understand the DAS and things. I think yeah. probably that was the case for a lot of people. Yeah. Um, so the, the way I got into NES Tetris um, then was um, when the CTWC was starting. Um, 2010. Robin advertised it. Yeah, 2010. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Robin advertised it on Tetris Concept Forums. Uh, Trey actually reached out on Facebook yeah. and asked if I had heard about it or if I was interested in it because he had seen some of my posts about Tetris and things. And then it kind of went from there where I was like, oh, no, I don't think I'm interested, but let me check this game out again. And then, uh, uh, you know, saw Jonas's YouTube videos and learned about, you know, that he was using DAS when I thought, you know, oh, this, I thought this was just a tapping game. I saw other people's YouTube videos and there were tappers like Spectre. Uh, and then it kind of just all snowballed from there, you know, yeah. started analyzing the game, realizing how DAS worked. It's, you know, actually pretty interesting in a way that other Tetris games didn't have that kind of mechanic. Yeah. Um, the way their DAS works is very different. And I was like, okay, I'll, I'll try to challenge this. And then next thing I know, you know, I'm carpooling down with Dana down to the, the first. Uh, you know, 2010 CTWC. So what, back to the 90s, you said you were into Grandmasters, uh, uh, your Grandmaster mm -hmm. on all three, all three games. What captured mm -hmm. your attention towards the Grandmaster series? Um, so the way I found out about the Grandmaster series was um, 
it was actually like a pre YouTube viral video. It's like when things were going around on, you know, like uh, wimp.com and ebombs world and all these like viral video sites where they would just find some video and upload it and uh, it would get passed around, you know, email chains and things like that, or, you know, dig or slash dot, you know, <laughs> all these like very early uh, type of uh, link sharing sites, you know, yeah. Reddit and things. Um, but uh, one of the uh, Arika promotional videos for TGM2 death mode shared on one of those viral video sites. And I think that's how a lot of people learned about the series at the time. And then they're like, well, how do I get a hold of this? How do I play it? And then have to like, kind of like research, like, oh, it's a Japan only arcade game. Uh, you know, how do I find you know, some sort of uh, recreation or, you know, some sort of, you know, emulation of that? Uh, yeah. Because it wasn't accessible here. Um, and that's kind of how I got started on it. Um, and then um, I think at the time also like you know I, I couldn't find you know a version of the game that i could play yeah. at full speed on my computer i was like you know i was young when i first started playing um or like trying to play it. i was you know like 12 or something oh yeah um um and then later i picked it back up um when tetris ds came out um i was that was a, a really popular version of the, uh, the game. You know, played a lot with friends, the multiplayer versus and everything. Yeah. Uh, but then the single player, you could just play at 20G forever because uh, there was infinite lock delay and you could like rotate and like kind of spin over things. And so it was more of a like endurance challenge than like a survival challenge. Yeah. Um, so the way I got back into it was like I started looking up, um, well, I started looking up stuff about Tetris DS, you know, T spins and things. And then I found the Tetris concept forums. And then from there also, rediscovered tgm and decided to pick it back up still on the emulator or trying to get what well, i mean it's difficult to get original hardware from japan all the mm -hmm. way to the us yeah i think at that um at that era you know i was you know still a bit young and a little bit uh short of cash to um fulfill all of my arcade owning dreams yeah um so at that point in time yeah you know picked it back up you know found what you would need to emulate or play, you know, fan games, you know, uh, trainers, yeah. uh, you know, versions of the game that were, you know, recreate the rules to some extent. Um, but then, you know, when I was, uh, um, when I went to college yeah. and um, decided, okay, well, I, I have the fortune for my parents to uh, have sort of a uh, allowance for spending money for things, you know, to, to go out to, you know, get food with people and things like that, uh, yeah. or just, you know, things that I needed, necessities. But I decided, okay, well, I think if I save this, you know, and allocate it out over a certain amount of time that I could start to buy uh, the arcade hardware they've always had an eye on. I know this is the kind of thing that I'll be into for a while, and, you know, um, and also just, you know, if I ever need to, you know, it's something that I could trade around with other arcade enthusiasts. Uh, yeah. But that never happened. I've just kept it since, uh, just bought TGM1 first, <laughs> and... You know, later down the line, bought TGM2 and had all this stuff to, you know, hook it up to a normal TV. Um, yeah, back in the era before we had these, you know, home versions uh, to be able to play. Yeah, like now TGM is on the Switch. Uh, it got recently released on, on the Switch. But you had to go out mm -hmm. and, and actually buy the the arcade version. Uh, are mm -hmm. you a, an arcade collector? Um, I don't know if I would, like... I don't know how to put it. I guess like I do have like a library of things. Um, I, I'm not exactly like a collector as far as like there are certain things that I can go without or that like, uh, you know, um, I suppose like I'm not building it for the purpose of having like a big collection, but yeah. I do like having various games. And um, if there's if there is a version of the game that, you know, only has an arcade version or that I would you know like to put into a cabinet at some point in time, you know, I'll try to get the original hardware for some things. But, um I think I've got a lot of what um, I want to have at this point too. Um, yeah, and I mean every not once in a while I'll learn about something new. Like for example, when um, when the uh, Hatteras World Championship uh, was organized by uh, Vince and uh, Bidwell, um, I, I realized that the arcade version, which was what I was more familiar with videos of, uh, yeah. is actually very different from the NES version. So I was like, okay, well. I might as well find a copy of this because it, it's another one that doesn't have a home version of any kind. It, the arcade version is very different from, you know, the Game Boy or NES or so on. So I'm like, okay, yeah, um, it's not too expensive. I can pick up a copy of that, that kind of thing. Every once in a while, I'll pick up something new. And uh, still playing Tetris DS, for, uh, for example? Um, I think with a lot of the um, modern versus games, um, it kind of has uh, moved on to newer things over yeah. time. 
um, one of the things that you'll find with a lot of the older um, the older guideline versus games is that they're kind of slow. Like the DAS is kind of slow. Yeah. Um, like it's kind of uh, it's on the borderline where it's like, okay, should I be tapping or should I be using DAS? So I think that's one aspect. And also just like the rules. Um, Tetris DS is sort of an older one where it's got really clean garbage sends um, and um, Tetris and, and T-spins only, no combo rules and things like that. So I think um, every once in a while it'll get pulled out into like sort of like a multi-format tournament yeah. or that sort of thing. Um, but I think, yeah, I think most of the, um, like I did play when there was like a, one of the hard drop opens had it as one of the, uh, versions you could pick. It was a multi-format tournament where you could pick, like, uh, there was like, I think like five or seven games and you could, uh, decide which ones you didn't want to play. It was like a pick ban process, like a draft <laughs> you'd play against the other person and you'd play, yeah. oh, I want to play, you know, Tetris DS and Tetranet, but I don't want to play, uh, Tetrio or I don't want to play worldwide combos. It was, yeah. uh, it was one of the games in that, and I played it in that, and that was fun to kind of go back to the old versions. So did you try all the various uh, guideline modern Tetris games, like we have now Tetrio, GH Trist, uh, uh, Tetris mm -hmm. 99, and all that? Is it something, when a new Tetris game comes out, you want to play it, you want to uh, be good at it, or, or is it something like, I want to pick up all those games just as a casual fan? Um, I guess it kind of varies. Um, I played a lot of Tetris 99 when it first came out, um, I had a lot of fun with it. I think the format was kind of cool. Um, yeah. Able to adapt a battle royale format for um, you know Tetris game. I, I think it was a fun and unique thing. Um, the reason I kind of dropped off of Tetris 99 is I feel like they didn't, I guess, kind of know how to turn that into something that uh, would keep keep people coming back. Um, yeah. It kind of had some like sort of tournaments where it's like as long as you played enough, you could kind of. Uh, Get whatever the the eShop points they were offering, or like I guess then they pivoted to you know giving out exclusive themes every once in a while to like advertise a new game. They didn't really have like a leaderboard or like a matchmaking like system like uh, like the long haul. So I kind of just felt like okay, well I played enough of this and kind of didn't feel like playing more of it. Um, whereas I guess uh, they've learned to some extent with some of the newer ninety nine games. I, I've been playing uh, F zero ninety nine some, and I feel like the um, the way that they have a uh, Grand Prix, uh, timed Grand Prix, uh, yeah. every once in a while, it's like every like hour or whatever, they'll have like <laughs> a more competitive room um, with like a different format. I, I've been having a lot of fun with that. Um, oh. But yeah, I guess like I've, I have the same sort of thing with uh, other modern games too. It's like I could play versus, but I just feel like it's bounced from game to game a lot, and yeah. I just kind of haven't set with one. Um, Tetrio, I played some to get like ranking points. Um, like I'm probably around like I was around like high U U rank when I was playing it. Yeah. Um not quite on the cusp of X yet, but um yeah, I don't know. It's just like I, I float around between stuff and like sometimes the modern versus holds my interest and sometimes I feel like doing something else. Um I don't even always play the S Tetris or TGM like all the time either. I yeah. kind of bounce from game to game, so um, we'll see. Maybe I'll do a modern versus thing again at some point. So what do you consider as your main Tetris game? Um, if I had to have a main Tetris game, probably the TGM series. Yeah, um, yeah I, I would say yeah, TGM 2 is probably my favorite of the like three mainline arcade games. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, but yeah, I'll, I'll bounce between whatever it seems like uh, I want to, you know, work on this achievement or that achievement or you know, that's why TTWC kind of is the time of year that is like, okay, I should probably be practicing up for NES a little bit more, that kind of thing. Yeah, because I heard rumblings like in the, in the early days of CTWC, like uh, uh, it was only once a year and then players mm -hmm. uh, just practiced like a month, a month and a half before they went to Portal for CTWC. Was that was it the same for you or were you playing NES Tetris all year, uh, all year round? Um, I think that for me, I like kind of think of the timeline a little bit. I think I played it um, a little bit more often of the year when I was still chasing the max out. Yeah. Um, and then when I had got that under my belt, I think, you know, maybe I would still pull it out on Twitch every once in a while. But then the, the main goal for me was like a lot of TGM stuff. So then if I was streaming stuff on Twitch or, um, you know, even just playing in my own time, um, then it would be more TGM accomplishments. Um, 
So yeah, for me, yeah. Tetris was the thing I would, you know, play more, you know, weeks or months leading up to CTWC yeah. rather than something year round. Um, uh, you know, I already had my tape into t Twin Galaxies. Uh, you know, I already had you know some videos or clips up on YouTube or Twitch or whatever. And yeah, um, it was before people were really going for a lot of um, earliest Max or um, a lot of, I guess. Um, uncap because you know the uncap code by josh hadn't come out yet so i yeah. kind of moved on to other stuff in tetris at that point in time and then it was just more of like okay well, i'll play for ctwc each year so 2010 ctwc a first year uh is a movie announced xc mm -hmm. of order they they follow eight players uh and they sort already follow five players and then three open spots uh for ctwc like you said mm -hmm. you got uh, invited by trey you got uh, invited by by robin mahara but mm -hmm. you were, I believe, the number nine seat. Like, you just fell out mm -hmm. of CTWC. What's the story behind that? Um, yeah, it's an interesting story just because of how differently the qualifiers worked in the first two years when they were sort of trying to figure out what formats would work in the amount of time that they had. Yeah. Um, and it, in fact, the, uh, the format changed what they wanted to do. Um, what was announced uh, beforehand was that the qualifiers were going to be a three-minute score attack on A-type. Um, yeah. So, you know, the, I guess, atmosphere around that was, the, I don't know, like if they were going to try to use a custom version of the software or something, uh, and then that didn't pan out, or like what it might have been. Um, you know, there's rumors about all of that. But one way or another, what ended up being announced was, okay, we can't use the... Um, you know, format that we had drafted for this and uh it's gonna have to switch to b type and that was you know announced like a week before and that was what everyone didn't want to happen because they oh. knew okay now it's going to become rng uh possibility uh you know just rolling for those seven tetrises to yeah. get the perfect b type score and then going for pushdown points um and the other aspect of it was that um qualifiers were pay per attempt so it was Ooh. like three dollars per ticket and they also um, only had ticket sales open for like a certain amount of the qualifying period. It was like, I think like maybe like a hour, 45 minute, 30 minute period at the end where it's like you could use all the tickets that you had had, but it was kind of like the line was cut off. Yeah. Um, so when I got perfect seven Tetris, I'm like, okay, I think I'm good. That looks like a strong enough score. I can take a break. And everyone else was still, you know, going for their, their scores. And I think even, um, I don't, know for sure but you know the you know the four people that got perfects were uh prey and matt buko and myself and dana and i think possibly trey and matt might have still also been cycling the line to improve their scores but like however it turned out um got hers um as the you know fourth person to get it yeah and that bumped me out and i only had one ticket left in my pocket to try to get back in line and play well, I will try to play it and see what happens. And if it yeah. doesn't go, then, you know, I will shake Dana's hand and congratulate yeah. her on uh, getting to the main stage. Uh, and as it turned out, uh, you know, the P sequence had me make a hole or like burn a triple with a, a long bar or something. I'm like, okay, well, that's it. Um, yeah. You know, that was my tournament run. I'll just have to try again if this ever happens again and, uh, you know, cheer on from the audience. Were you disappointed or were you like, okay, this is what it is? Uh, I mean... It was disappointing, um, but I also have to accept, you know, that was the, I was what the format was that year. You know, yeah. I had an opportunity to keep trying, but you know, my, uh, I think that's definitely why, in the later years, you know, they tried to figure out how to adapt the format. You know, because the format was just for the amount of time that we had. You know, it's like a one day format. You have yeah. to have like a small block of time. You can't have full games of A type going. The lines will be, you know, crushing. Yeah. Um, and you know that's also why the next year they added the. Um, in 2011, they had the 19 rule, which is if you clear 19, they, the organizers will spot you an extra 100k to balance it so it's better to get a non-perfect 19 than it is to get a perfect 18. Oh. Um, so then it turned into a thing where um, uh, you had people getting, you know, three, four, five Tetrises on level 19 in B-type, but that 100k would make it more than a... Um, uh more than a level 18 perfect yeah 
Uh, and that was sort of things that they would try to do to like make the RNG aspect a little bit less or like make the skill uh, aspect a little bit higher, like less about push down, more about um, just efficiency, I guess. Yeah. I think it's trial and error, especially when when you host something like this for the first time. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you have to like figure out how to deal with what you know resources you got. You know, you d you only have that venue for one day. Uh, I think they did the best that they could with the the circumstance, yeah. and I just said, okay, well, you know, if I if I really wanted to push harder, I could have spent more, you know, three dollar tickets and tried <laughs> to get a better score. But I, uh, you know, I, that's the gamble that the early formats were a little bit like. Um, Oh, man. Uh, and then you know they kind of optimized it on the later years. Yeah. Do you remember how many tickets you bought? Uh no, I have like sort of like a vague recollection that. Well, if I think about it, mm, probably spent like less than fifty dollars. Like let's just say like forty five, right? Oh yeah. Um, uh, and I also think that you got like with your entrance, like I forget how much the entrance fee was, but you got like a couple of tickets, like you know one, two, three tickets to start with. Oh, yeah. But let's just say like, you know, 45 divided by, you know, divided by the three or whatever, you know, you know, that could have been, uh, you know, 15 tickets or 15. Yeah. And, you know, I, I don't really, that seems kind of high. I don't know, but it, it's not higher than that. I would say, you know, double digits, maybe if I like really like kept cycling through, but yeah. yeah. So 2010 also had a very weird format, like, they only played a match, I believe. The semifinals and the finals were only like matches that we know right now. Mm. Uh, so, which year did you say that was? So, like in 2010, mm -hmm. like the the mm -hmm. first round uh, was like not the conventional sure, way the we we have out. yeah like like we have right now. Right now, it's matches all the way through one v one, but that wasn't a one v one match. Yeah, they had sort of like a. Uh... I guess sort of like a pool like survivor format type of thing uh the the thing that it made me think of the most was uh it reminds me of like a lot of pinball tournaments where you might have like four people in a match but then it's like like gp scoring um you know like you know four wins versus two wins versus one wins versus yeah. zero wins kind of thing um but uh yeah the first year they had like kind of like a percentage thing where it's like uh i think since they had some players that focused on score and some that focused on lines they wanted to have sort of a um, mixed format where there was like a, a you know line survival aspect where you know whoever has the most lines is the hundred percent player and then the rest have like a percent you know like they're getting points down from that yeah uh, and then there was a score yeah it was like is it two lines and a score or something like that I don't really remember uh, the the movie goes over it um, yeah I think it was just a, an, an aspect to try and figure out like well other tournaments do it like this or you know maybe we could do it like that and yeah. trying to figure out like what worked and it hadn't and they kind of knew that like the finals would be that one v one yeah know, score aspect um but i think yeah they're just like trying to figure out what works with the amount of time they have they only have like the one big you know a uh, projector with all of the screens on it yeah um yeah and you know maybe not like the resources to like uh or like you know ref all of the different screens so they just kind of add it up and like, okay we'll just have everyone fight each other in one shot which uh might be fun to have some experimental formats like that again sometime um yeah, Grand Designs is doing a lot of uh, with Classic Dr. Mm -hmm. Wars, has Battle Royale, uh, play uh, eight consecutive, consecutive games, and then if you win that round, you get 10 points and eight points and all that. But, and mm -hmm. a pairing challenge and, and oh my, a lot of, a lot of eight, eight players, uh, uh, like non-conventional uh, Tetris matches. But I think that now with the online era, the, mm -hmm. the original rule set of CTWC, that would that would work perfect for an online match, like like someone get around four to six plays and and uh, learn mm -hmm. the original rules of CTWC, and and I think that would work perfect in an online setting. Yeah, it'd be fun to just pull these like weird formats out of the hat and try yeah. them again. Um, the other one that might be fun is like kind of spin that a little bit into like sort of like a battle royale format where it's like okay, if you're uh, top percent of the scores in the first round and then you move on like you have to be in the top you know 75 percent or you know yeah top uh you know two-thirds or something and then you go on to the next round and then it keeps going until you've got you know two people left or something yeah and then one v one match sudden death game yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. so did you play it a lot of any centers between ctwc 2010 and ctwc 2011 um probably enough to get um Get that first max out um and at that time i wasn't 
streaming on Twitch yet because I, I didn't really have a capture card figured out. Yeah. Um, and I didn't have like a webcam. That was like the era where a lot of people were streaming to, um, I mean, even like before Twitch, it had been like Ustream and Justin TV and things. Oh, and yeah. um, um, so people were just pointing their camera at the screen. Um, and so I, I didn't even have like a USB webcam to use for that yet. Yeah. Um, so I, I was also like when people were still sending tapes to Twin Galaxies. So I, I played and was recording onto this tape until I got a max out and sent it in. And it was like their sixth video or whatever that they, uh, that they verified. Um, and then um, after that, probably still some uh, because uh, I think it was uh, actually uh, Jesse, Jesse Kalkar uh, was like, hey, you just got to get on and, you know, get a camera, man. Like, it's not that expensive. <laughs> she just sent me one. She's like, what's your address? I'll, I'll send you a USB <laughs> webcam. You know, yeah. I, I don't know why I didn't get one before then, but I was just like, oh, I don't know. I'll, I'll figure it out. And like, um, but yeah, she just sent me one, uh, you know, thank you to Jesse. And uh, that's what got me, you know, streaming my, you know, little webcam stuff to uh, to Twitch. Uh, not even Twitch at that point. I guess still, yeah, Ustream, then Justin TV. I had a Justin TV account and then I had a migrate it to uh to twitch uh, and then also playing in ben's uh tiny chat tournaments yeah 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 the the first ever online tournaments mm -hmm. yeah it's yeah. it's it feels so weird like it's we're talking about 2010 2011 but still it feels like the beginning of the internet to me like twitch wasn't there YouTube, oh yeah youtube was five years old facebook was five years old or something like that google was 10 years old it's so weird that all the things that we know today, like all the matches are played on, on Twitch, Discord wasn't even a thing back in 2011. It's, it's mm -hmm. still feels new internet. Oh yeah. Yeah. It was like, uh, we hadn't, uh, we hadn't quite migrated to these, uh, you know, new, you know, five websites. We were on the old five websites, uh, yeah. you know, and people were using like a uh, tiny chat and, uh, you know, Skype even to communicate. Yeah. It was weird. Or like, a. You know, I remember I've got a lot of, you know, Gmail or uh, Google Google Chat or, you know, oh, Facebook yeah. communications with uh, a lot of the uh, the long bars uh, of, of days past. Yeah. So 2011, you reached the finals of, of CTWC. You, you lost against Jonas Neubauer. Was that yeah. a surprise to you that you that you reached the finals? Um, yeah, I mean, it, it felt like that kind of thing where because of how the scores in that era were like, it was like a lot of like playing for safety and not like your, you know, max outs. Yeah. Um, it felt like it was just within reach. If I played, you know, if I played consistently, everything felt like you could get there, but you felt like you had to push a little bit. Right. Yeah. Uh, especially, you know, it's not same piece sets, you know, there is some risk there of trying to, you know, get too far ahead of yourself. Um, so it was definitely, um, pulse pounding to be able to, you know, play through some of those other, you know, strong competitors like yeah. Harry, you know, to get up and face Jonas. Um, it felt achievable, but it felt difficult. Uh, like yeah. it felt like I, I didn't know that I would be there on that stage. Like it felt like I just had to keep trying to see the best that I could do each time. Yeah. Yeah. So mm -hmm. the, the, the second ever finalist, and, and I looked it up like between 2011 and 2019, you reached the top four, mm -hmm. four times, except for 2013 mm -hmm. and 2019, all the time top eight, like it, you, you were one of the, the like best dash players of one of the best earlier players in, in, in any mm -hmm. if you look at the results of CGWC. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think it was just, uh, I think one of the things that really gets me uh, that, you know, you, you mentioned some of these two years when I like, had a little bit of a harder time. I mean, like, especially like, um, I think what, 2013 was the year um, I lost to uh, Shaquille I.C., um, who also, you know, um, wasn't a, you know, weak player. It was just, um, I think even if you had that strength, it was uh, hard to be consistent in the same piece set. Um, and it was, you know, hard for me to be consistent and still is today. Like, I think since I don't play a lot of NES Tetris, the thing that gets me a lot is um, losing DAS. That's definitely what um, the big thing that I lost in the uh, match with Mike Winsonek, um, that you know top four year after that, yeah. was uh, I lost DAS and then couldn't figure out how to get like a bar over and it hung and that like ended a game like you know pre 200k or something. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I think that's uh, 
I think when I have the timing locked in, like if I've practiced it enough or like I, you know, don't, you know, overshoot things or undershoot things, um, I think I was able to leverage, I guess, the stacking ability that I had. Yeah. Um, but, you know, sometimes I lose it and, you know, 19 ranges and things can be a little bit tricky. Hitting those quick taps can be tricky. Um, yeah. I feel pretty happy with the results that I've, I've had over time. Um, and now that we're in the rolling era, you know, I, I mean, even before when I was DAS, <laughs> I think to do better and more consistent, I would have had to act as DAS like more through the year, or, like try to get, you know, better, like more consistent max outs or um, I guess um, cap, you know, it's never a thing yeah. I really focused on. Um, now and now it's gonna be rolling if I want to really place. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. You played in the you reached the finals in twenty seventeen. What was the last full death final? Uh, and after that, the hybrid serving era started. Now the rolling <laughs> era uh, uh, is here. It's like it's really an evolution that the game and the community has gone through. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. So it feels like. Whenever when when hybrid tapping like uh, became big, it it was already there. But when hybrid tapping became big, uh, when Joseph won in 20, uh, 2018 and created the boom, like we we never thought that we would have another playstyle that would literally obliterate all the records and even cost a human game crush. Yeah, yeah, I think it was one of those things where it just seemed like. We knew that there was tapping methods for other games and other like controllers, like bigger buttons and things um, that you could get more fingers on there or, you know, do other sort of like a, the other big method uh, is like things like the cradle mash, like where you'll have like a, oh, I got a controller right here. Here, I've got like a switch controller. Yeah. Like, you know, people will like, you know, mash on a button. You're outside of camera where I need to put it here. Yeah. There. Like two thumbs like that. But it's yeah. like, I can't really do that on a, on a NES e pad, it's too small to get consistent inputs out of it, like, yeah. and also be able to rotate at the same time. So it's just like, okay, how would you do that, right? It just seemed like it was out of reach. There's all this speculation, but then I guess, uh, you know, cheese with the innovation of like, well, we know that people can do track and field with, you know, the, the multi finger yeah. rolling. Um, we've, we've seen Flyhack could do that. Um, how can we get that onto an NES controller? And that, that was just, I guess, like the missing link of just, uh, well, let's do it indirectly and uh that was huge um and it just seemed like that kind of opened everything up yeah i mean it's uh, i would never have thought that that we would be tapping the back of the control <laughs> tapping the back of the controller to uh to have as a third play style yeah it's it's a uh, it's really clever i mean um if you can figure out a way to get those extra fingers in there you know like Raking wasn't working, you know, cradling wasn't working. Um, the back of the controller, yeah, why not? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and so you really saw every evolution or every change that, that was there from CTWC going from basically what was a movie project going to a full blown mm -hmm. CTWC, like an international version of uh, CTWC, the online uh, scene that, that got a boost and all that. So w w when you played CTWC in 2010 and, and it was a very niche game, like with a niche community. Everyone loved to hang around like once a year in, in Portland. But did you thought that this would become a worldwide game, like with a community worldwide and tournaments everywhere? Um, yeah, it's really interesting. Um, I hadn't predicted it um, because it's one of those versions of the game that, I mean, um, I mean, obviously, there's like PAL, which like, I mean, even at that time, I didn't know the that they had reprogrammed uh, PAL to be different because that's not something I've done often in the NES era. There's a lot of games that are just the same game, but slower. Yeah. Um, so then finding out, OK, well, PAL is like a whole different format. Um, and then also there's regions that just didn't get the version of Tetris that we did. You know, um, uh, Japan had their own, you know, versions of Tetris that came out on Famicom, the ones yeah. that were published by, uh, you know, PS instead of uh, the version that was by Nintendo. Like there's just like all the different like regional and like licensing stuff. Um, it didn't seem super likely at first, just since I knew well that's not the version that a lot of other people grew up with. But then people started importing it. You know, um, Yanni comes over the first year and he's like, oh wow, this play is like completely different um, than the version that I knew. Yeah, um, and he still places top eight the first time playing <laughs> NTSC. Um, he's like, why are my pieces weird and slow? 
well, whatever, I'm just going to roll with it. And he, you know, top eight, great. Um, and, um, you know, also then the Japan scene importing cartridges, um, you know, uh, SQR imported an NES Tetris uh, cartridge and brought it to uh, Pier 21, um, which is the arcade where a lot of players would go and play uh, TGM. Yeah. Like a, they have a monthly uh, like handicap uh, race tournament where everyone's racing against their PB, like trying to get as close to or below their PB as possible, oh, you know, yeah. um, like plus or minus. Yeah. Like, Everyone starts at different times based on what their adjusted PVs are. Yeah. Um, um, so yeah, he brought a copy of NES Tetris there, and uh, they put it in a cabinet, and they were playing, you know, either with the Famicom controllers or the joystick, and you know, seeing what they liked. And you know, Corian got a 200K on level 19, hyper tapping like the first time that he played it or something. Uh, yeah, it, it was yeah. really impressive to see. You know, more and more people are like, okay, well if this is the game that people are, you know, playing, um, you know, it's, it's interesting, that grassroots effort. Like, I don't think anyone could have like predicted that that would be what we'd be doing. Uh, but everyone's like, okay, well let's get, you know, Nesses and retrons and cartridges and yeah. let's just get this show on the road. Um, yeah, it was really, really exciting to see that kind of, um, uh, interesting movement and, and where it went with, uh, you know, even getting classic into uh, Tetris Effect connected and things like that. Things yeah. that didn't seem that likely, uh, with the climate to have, um, uh, Tetris company and things were in the years before with yeah. the guideline and not really allowing true classic types. Yeah. I was honestly surprised that we got a classic mode in, in Tetris Effect Connected. Mm -hmm. I think it's part of, of yeah. the, the boom that we created or that has been created by, by the community since 2018. Maybe since 2016, because mm -hmm. that's that's where the first viral video started. Yeah, absolutely. I think um I think it's one of those things where, you know, before then you know, they really stuck to the guideline and I guess maybe the branding benefits maybe that has, or I guess the uh, consistency aspects that that has, that there's like one rule set across, you know, whether it's a cell phone or a computer or whatever, Yeah. but that has its limitations. And I think that they saw with, you know, well also, yeah, like um, the games on quick demos for TGM in 2015, it right into the um, viral videos of CTWC and, you know, 2016 onward. Like immediately it was like clear that, okay, there is a lot of um, cultural value still in these older versions of the game. Yeah. Um, and that I think you can't really ignore that, right? You can't just keep saying, okay, well, um, yeah, these are like amazing free advertising. This is great marketing, um, but we're not going to let people play that version of the game anymore. Like we're not going to have it be accessible. Like that yeah. only goes so far. Like that, that may be also the reason why TGM got re suddenly released on the Switch. Yeah, um, it, it, was a, it was a really exciting sequence of events these like last, um, you know, five, ten years. Yeah. Um, after the Games Done Quick um, demos that we put on, um, they actually did um, a, another set of location tests for what would be Tetris the Grandmaster 4. Yeah. Um, they had previously it in um 2009 at arcade shows um but due to a variety of things publishing kind of fell through um and so they weren't going to be able to release it and um you know so then it was you know on hold you know shelved for a long period of time yeah and GDQ, gdq kind of happens and without you know publicly announcing anything it's like that's the time that they decide that there's this excitement to push and like try to at least bring it into have like these you know one day or weekend um location tests in arcades yeah. in the u.s even um so you know we flew flew down to um southern california you know people are coming all over or, like driving all over or flying all over to come and play this game that we, they might not get a chance to play for a long time yeah um and um so you have that event which is exciting and then you have you know the virality of the ctwc which is super exciting yeah. um I, I think it all just adds up into something where um you know, you start to see some small examples of it in the licensing beforehand. Like um, there were some either plug and play or like uh, at games arcade stuff that had, you know, either Famicom Tetris or Tetris Plus 2 or um, I think the first, you know, big exciting example for like, I guess, like Tetris aficionados would be um, the Genesis Mini or the Mega Drive Mini yeah. having a uh, port of the original uh, Sega 1988 arcade Tetris. Yeah. Um, it was like a, a bonus. It's like, oh, like we'll have all these old Sega um, Genesis games, 
and then we'll make a new port of the you know original big boom Japanese arcade Tetris, and we'll put this on the Mega Drive Mini. That that was another thing. It was like, oh man, like you couldn't have imagined that, you know, yeah. just, you know, a few years prior. And then I think that all kind of like leads into um, stuff like um, what we have now with the classic and and Tetris Effect and the the console versions of TGM. It's like they're loosening it up enough where they've like kind of come up with what those um, rules are going to be for, I guess, other, um, yeah, I guess more classic or like different than guideline rule sets coming out. Yeah. Do you, like we have uh, a classic Tetris, NES Tetris in Tetris mm -hmm. Connected. We have the TGM ports on, on the Switch as, as a separate mm -hmm. game. Uh, the Game Boy Tetris is packaged on uh, the Game Boy, uh, uh, like a sort of Game Boy app or something like that on, on Switch. Do you think they yeah. will release more uh, Tetris games like that? Or do you think like these are the three major uh, Tetris games from the past, like Game Boy, NES, and, and the Tetris uh, Grandmaster series? Um, I, I think it would really just depend on... It just feels like it would really depend on like the licensing and like working with a Tetris company. Like I'm not sure who else would um, go up to try to put their you know older releases out there. Yeah. Um, uh, I think I think Tetris coming back to the uh, NSO um, Game Boy emulator is interesting because just for a handful of years it felt like Nintendo wasn't going to really play ball with the Tetris company. Like that's how it felt to me anyway. Yeah. Um, because um, if we harken back, uh, the 3DS also had a virtual console. They had some other, you know, old games that they released on there. And it did have Game Boy Tetris at that point in time. Yeah. Um, but it was pulled from the eShop uh, as part of the um, licensing around um, Tetris Ultimate by Ubisoft. Yeah. It had a lot of exclusive licenses toward a lot of pl platforms. And I guess, however, that uh, contract played out. Uh, versus the contracts that um, um, you know, uh, either like Hudson had for uh, Tetris on 3DS, or um, Nintendo had for um, Game Boy version of Tetris. Those versions got pulled from digital downloads, yeah. and then Tetris Ultimate went up instead. Um, and that even did some weird stuff where, like, um, later on in the PS4, um, when uh, Puyo Puyo Tetris was being re-released on all those platforms, uh, the new version of it. Um, you couldn't get the demo on PS4 and you couldn't get a digital download. You had to buy retail for a while just because yeah. the Tetris Ultimate licensing was on the way. Cool. Um, so I I was uh, pretty impressed that we got another version of Tetris back just because um, they were doing Dr. Mario on the NES Classic and they did yeah. Dr. Mario in the um, NES Classic Remix on 3DS, which was sort of, uh, it had a, um, I guess like, Nintendo World Championships inspired um, mode on there. Yeah. And instead of Tetris at the end, it was like Super Mario and then Super Mario Brothers 3 and then Tetris because they, you know, didn't have Rad Racer from Squaresoft anymore. Yeah. And they didn't have Tetris from the Tetris company. So like, okay, we'll, we'll just use all Nintendo IP for this. Um, just like Dr. Mario's creation in the first place was to have a Nintendo puzzle IP. <laughs> yeah. So, um, so I think um, in terms of having other Tetris releases, I, I just think it would depend on the licensing. I think Tetris companies kind of learned their lesson probably with the Tetris Ultimate stuff because I feel like that didn't pan out too well for them, unfortunately. Yeah. So maybe they won't, you know, pull stuff anymore. Uh, maybe they'll make sure that like whatever licensing that they have with people, you know, they'll understand that they might want a provision that this stays up permanently. Yeah. You know, Tetris 99 hasn't been pulled or anything. Um, unlike, you know, Pac-Man 99 or, or things like that. Yeah. It, it but feels, I'm, I'm trying to think, yeah. Yeah, it feels like that the Tetris company is trying to redeem themselves. Like, they, mm -hmm. they got a lot of, uh, like, a lot of flag, a lot of bad names, especially around 2015, like, somewhere along that line. Mm. Being very harsh on online games, we were very harsh on like this is this is the guideline, this this is what you what you need to do. And I feel like since Tetris Effect connected, like since the classic mode that that like you said, they loosened up a bit. Yeah, definitely. I think, yeah, between the virality of certain things and between, I guess, the increased demand that that generated, you know, you can only, I guess, ignore that free advertising for so long. And then also if if you're not 
fulfilling that market need um, than options that people have. I mean, there's only, you know, for the, for the NES, like, yeah, sure, people can go out and like on the second market, secondary market, that doesn't really make it, um, you know, completely uh, filled niche, but at least people can buy cartridges for, you know, not super expensive. It's not like arcade versions and things. Yeah. But, um, you know, if they want people to buy their games and people are demanding a certain kind of product, like, if the only option is to, you know, buy this $1,000 arcade game that only went up because of, you know, the uh, virality of it, or yeah. only went up because of uh, COVID lockdowns, things like that. Yeah. And um, if that's the same fate that other versions might have at some point too, with like, oh, now there's like a shortage of any Tetris cartridges or any other version, um, you know, you can only go so far with saying like, hey, people shouldn't, uh, you know, quote unquote, clone this, or people, you know, shouldn't uh, emulate this. Um, people are going to be stuck in a place where, like, the, like I, I think, you know, it's like the, you know, the Valve quote. Uh, I forget the exact, but like to paraphrase, just that um, piracy is sort of an indication of a unfulfilled market. Like, yeah. if you're not, um, if you're not addressing the market needs in terms of like whether that means um, ease of access or the pricing or like whatever that might be. Um, then, yeah, people are, are going to turn to like other means to get their their media. Yeah. Um, and you can, if the best possible thing that you can do is to say, well, okay, if there's this need, um, we're going to fill it. Um, you know, turn would be, you know, piracy into an actual, you know, you know, eight dollar version on Switch or whatever it yeah. is, right? Do you think something similar can can happen with Tetris Gym, for example? Like the vanilla the vanilla cartridge can do so many, but it felt like the need mm -hmm. for more uh, uh, NES Tetris was there than Kajava uh, created Tetris Gym. Do you think that can some mm -hmm. uh, can turn into like you said eighty eight dollar uh, a game, for example? Um. Yeah. I mean, I the the thing that I guess it always comes back down to is just that um. In order to have you know a licensed trademarked Tetris product, then you have to go through I guess the um step to talk to the Tetris company you have to see what the um I guess um other parties that might be involved you know like I, I don't know if uh for example if if Nintendo is still involved in terms of uh copyright holding and things like that for the NES Tetris um which is like a, a significant portion if you're going to release a Tetris chip cartridge that's like you know newly produced then a lot of that code is um you know, the original NES Tetris, um, yeah. and you're stacking stuff on top of that, then that would be a derivative work. Um, so, you know, there's a lot of things to, I guess, talk about in terms of like how you would be able to get that kind of product to market and if the numbers would work for um, for the Tetris company. Yeah. Um, I guess the other interesting aspect is, um, is it possible for us to also have um, upgrade kits for original NES Tetris cartridges? Um, because in, in the same way that um, CTWC um, is able to have their, you know, super game genie approach to the competition cartridges, yeah. um, where they're not supplanting the market need for original produced NES Tetris cartridges, they're not, you know, doing anything outside of the realm of what, um, you know, the Tetris company today or Nintendo at the time uh, yeah. would have been doing in terms of cartridge production. Like, we're not producing new cartridges, we're producing, you know content that sits in front of it yeah um it's like an addendum right the only thing that's being produced in terms of a copyrighted work is that addendum um if a way to make devices like that um you could see maybe people instead um making you know upgrade kits um yeah. which you know it's like a whole different type of product at that point and then that probably is something where it's maybe more in bounds i guess you know if that conversation doesn't work but we still need like versions of Tetris Gym or competition, more competition carts for like regionals and things. Um, there could be that aspect in, as well. Yeah. So you're in charge of those uh, uh, super uh, game genies for, for CTWC. Um, when did that mm -hmm. start? Um, that started this year. Um, uh, like maybe like a, I don't remember the exact timeline, but you know, I I got asked uh, about it uh, whether I'd be able to you know at least update the cartridges with new random uh, content. 
yeah. you know, a handful of months before. And it was just sort of like trying to figure out how that, you know, there was some logistics uh, along the way, figuring out how that, you know, would be done this year. Yeah. Um, and um, yeah, I, uh, you know, was able to, I guess, figure out um, an approach for updating that and also, um, you know, making some small tweaks for this year's uh, cartridge uh, software. Yeah. Um, I, I, you know, took the base from, you know, 2022 and then made a few changes for the uh, super kill screen. And then also um, I um, changed to the randomizer, which um, when Trey and I originally designed the uh, randomizer that we used um, for the original cartridge, yeah. you know, when we were talking in Gmail and just like passing scripts and concepts back and forth, um, we used um, like one out of seven probabilities because we weren't sure how we would uh, use the system that we came up with for um, original NES, like weird probabilities, like how we would replicate that. Yeah. Um, but in the years since, um, I had a proof of concept that um, would be able to adapt the kind of system that we used to new NES probabilities. Um, and, um, and I had that sitting on a shelf. I, I'd given the proof of concept to Trey, but I think the couple years before, he hadn't been able to, um, he didn't have that, the time to, um, I guess, adapt it for that. Yeah. So yeah. This year, like, you know, in the, like, I guess, you know, uh, as sort of like a personal project in the like week or two before I was like, okay, well, and I've got some, you know, weekends time, uh, maybe I can, in addition to getting this, uh, new shuffle in, maybe I can also improve it by integrating the stuff I had written before to get yeah. the new probabilities. Um, so that was, that was pretty quick, um, for the event, but, um, I, Vince and he approved, you know, if it's going to be a better experience or like more close to the original game, uh, go for it. Uh, if you think it's going to be what's better for the players, then yeah, you have my approval. And I was able to kind of get that quickly tested and make sure it was good and then got yeah. that in there. Yeah. So mm -hmm. you, you, you try to really create the more of the original RNG with, with this year's, uh, this year's card. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, essentially what I did was, uh, I, at some point had this Eureka moment where it's like, okay, well, I think it was partially because of, um, during the time when we were like, uh, well, when, uh, green tea was working on Tetris effect connected, uh, people noticed that the RNG was, um, a little bit different in some areas than yeah. the, uh, NES Tetris cartridge. And, um, I talked to green tea about it and realized like, oh, okay. Like, um, if this is like, he like described roughly like how the RNG worked in their version of the game. Yeah. Uh, like what the pseudo code was for their um, randomizer. And it's like, okay, like the math is all the same for the RNG, but the difference was um, that it was um, getting a completely different random number for the first roll and the second roll. Whereas NES Tetris, like some of the weird math comes from, we have this first roll and then we divide it by two to use it in the second roll. It's like we shift it down one. Um, yeah. So there's like a, there's some like number theory, like the relationship between the first roll and the second roll actually has some like probability um, yeah. that it impacts. So I realized, like, I think that probably is part of what triggered. It's like, oh, well, if we use the same code, like, we don't use our own um, code for the selection method. If we just, like, instead of having a different um, randomizer that is pulling from, you know, randomness that's one out of seven, yeah, we pull from random numbers, like random bits, and then pass that to the original NES Tetris code, like the original function, we leave it unchanged. We just give it a, you know, random number that's selected from a deck instead of, you know, constantly cycling. Yeah we can get the same probabilities. We can get to the same odds because it's, well, it's the same math that's happening. You know, instead of this layer, let's move it up to this layer, you know? Yeah. Like, just, uh, yeah, just a slight change in approach and was able to get the, uh, you know, sadistic, uh, you know, long barred routes that we're used to, you know, the 13% uh, I pieces and, you know, uh, yeah. more T's and J's and Z's and stuff. Yeah. So I doubt that uh, that for every seat you're handpicking the first one hundred thousand, uh, one hundred thousand, first thousand pieces by uh, by hand. Like I mm -mm. think that's all that's all code and all that. But yeah, like, you you're mm -hmm. mentioning uh, something like thirteen percent of high pieces, a little bit more for T and J. Uh, CDWC just happened, like in in October twenty twenty three. Uh, does Vince come to you and and gives you feedback from the players, like they feel like we get a lot more J pieces compared to what feels natural or we get a little less of square pieces. Is that something what you try to adjust for uh, next year's CTWC? Um, no, I think we're just going to keep 
uh, letting it ride. I mean, even uh, in the previous years, you know, we, um, Ray had his own scripts that would like tell him what the odds were and things. Because I think um, what he said was sometimes Jonas would like to play on the randomizers. Like after the event, he would like to play on the seeds that had really hard long bar counts and things like that. Yeah. Um, similarly, I have, you know, in my version of the RNG that I like slightly tweaked, I, you know, change, I have my own simulator that can tell me, oh, okay, like here's what the odds are for these things, or like here, like this stuff is consistent with what the probabilities are supposed to be. Yeah. Um, but I'm not handpicking anything. Um, he wasn't handpicking anything. Um, we just give a new shuffle each year. Um, I don't think I would adjust anything. Um, there's nothing really to adjust. It's the same math. Um, um, yeah, and yeah, I think it's interesting that you uh, ask about like you know players noticing things and that sort of thing. Um, I have not had any complaints. I think I've only had you know approval um, yeah. in 2022. I think it was you know some of the players like Fractal and Eric, um, maybe some others had uh, commented that it felt like the RNG was easier. Uh, I know even in previous years, um, Harry had said that the RNG feels like he didn't like the RNG of the mm -hmm. same piece sets carts mm -hmm. of the you know previous years. Yeah, I don't know if that's because he noticed that it was different. Um, it should, in theory, be easier, right? Because you're getting more equal um, odds for all the pieces. Yeah. Um, but he, you know, there were comments that things felt different. Um, yeah, no complaints. Um, the only thing is, like, I mean, I guess, well, the usual kind of complaints, like, oh man, the RNG was really hard, but they're not <laughs> yeah. saying like you need to fix this. They're saying like, well, that's yeah. just how it is. <laughs> so, I mean, any any given random Tetris game can be very hard, like the the RNG. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so I think if if you didn't have any complaints like this feels different you did a pretty good job creating as close to original uh tetris uh, rng yeah i i feel good about it um uh, it's uh feels like the game normally is uh, yeah you, know, you gotta account for weird stuff or weird droughts and by chance I, I don't know if that's the hardest on the cart but you know for finals uh they're like hey like i think I think it was Pumpy that might have suggested it, but you know, uh, Fractal and Sidna have both agreed to it. They're like, "Hey, why not? It's the finals. Do you want to just see what nine 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 is? What you know, random seed nine 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 is?" And it was like yeah. the most brutal seed with just droughts and droughts and like low bar counts. And yeah, just, they, the creativity that we saw on display there was amazing. So yeah, I think I think we're on a good path with it. It made for an amazing game. Like you know, you have the, the best two players there, and they know how to handle. Uh, a drought like that and it's it's still what we see with ctm fastest mass is starting on on 19 with transition strainer on like even that getting max out from 19 to uh to 39 is like it's so impressive oh yeah yeah it's it's crazy the, the efficiency that people have um I, I just can't believe the adjustments that people are learning at this point in time, too. I mean, I, I think it's uh, that's another interesting thing about the whole rolling play style and um, not having to worry quite as much about um, DAS maintenance. Um, yeah. is just that um, you can get your piece there fast and then see what the next piece is going to be. And rather than have to worry about, oh, is this going to cost my next move? Or like, yeah. do I have to do like an awkward little like fireball pivot over? Um, they can just be like, okay, well, the best thing to do here is rotate and shift it over, just to uh, make it happen. Yeah. Um, or even just cross, cross field, you know, roll it over to the other side if you really see something uh, aggressive. Yeah. Um, it's a lot of fun to see what um, new, um, I guess, stacking potential there is, and having that thirty hertz or you know even like you know twenty hertz movement. It's it's amazing. It's it's so fascinating to see. Like I know I I'm not even going to try it. I tried it, but. I don't, I don't have the capability, but it's so fascinating to see. Like, it goes from left to right, from center, and super kill screen. Oh my god, it's so fast. <laughs> it's so fast. Yeah, yeah. I, I think uh, I think someone was saying that the limits in super kill screen is like, if you're playing um, DAS in PAL at limit, but the game is going twice as fast, right? Yeah, um, yeah the, the reaction time you need for any amount of lines in that is absurd. Um, and if people ever play into that for any amount of time, you know, maybe we add, you know, another like 30 lines in, we triple it or something, <laughs> you know, <laughs> but it's uh, we're getting to the uh, the limit of when the NES Tetris will let you play. <laughs> I think so, because I think all major, almost all major uh, accomplishments have been uh, have been reached except for like the true level rollover, like go from to level mm -hmm. 255 back 
to to level zero. And it's possible with with the Tetris gym. It's not possible with the with the original uh, vanilla card. But that's that's basically the only major goal that's left because we had we reached colors on both versions. Uh, Blue Scooty last week with the first ever human uh, game crash. Mm -hmm. Triple rollovers. It's it's yeah. It's it's. They say that Tetris is that, but I feel like it's only for score attack. Like, but mm. competition is always will always be interesting. Yeah, there's always some sort of format that people can try to figure out. There's like there's always like weird achievements that you know, like you know, Game Crash. You know, we never thought that people would be able to play that long. Like, uh, it like seemed theoretically like in PAL possible to max it out, but we hadn't seen that proven. It seemed theoretically possible at that point that you could get PAL colors, but it had been proven. Um, you know, there's all these things that like seemed theoretically in the realm of possibility if you like really had some sort of, you know, at the time we thought superhuman ability, but now we've figured out these new methods uh, that yeah. put it like easier in reach. Uh, and, and, you, and you said that, you know, you feel like you can't roll and I, I understand it. Like it's like definitely daunting um, figuring out the timing for things, but we're also, you know, coming up with new tools for practicing it. Um, this roll tool, which will like, give you detailed, you know, subframe precision information about yeah. here's when the button was pressed down and here's when it was not. And if you see like, oh, those bars are too big and too close together, like maybe I need to like drag my fingers off of it differently. Like you can eventually figure out either a grip or, you know, um, you know, how the timing for the fingers is to get rolls to come out. And then even if it's slow at first, even if you're like only getting 15 hertz, like 15 hertz is better than DAS. Um, yeah. yeah. You can start to build it into something more than that. It's it's amazing what the community has done with the game. Like they took the vanilla game and and made it more. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think it's really interesting too. Like the whole double kill screen thing is really fun because I feel like it's a very like um, history repeats itself sort of situation. Um, with um, the original Sega arcade Tetris, um, it also is a game that goes to um, Bungie or like you know the. Um, piece falling one row per frame, yeah. but it has lock delay. Um, so it's like a whole different kind of game. And also it's like different because it's uh, got single rotation, like you can only rotate one direction. Um, you have three buttons to do it. it. It will support it if the cabinet has three buttons. You can like roll all three buttons to get oh, a yeah. triple rotate. Um, but it's like, yeah, it's like the mechanics of that game are very different. Um, but it was that thing where it's like at first, you know, that was fast enough to maybe halt people's games, but then eventually people were playing um, just, you know, forever, you know, get max out the score counter, max out the lines counter, max out the level counter, um, you know, just play all day on a single credit, right? Yeah. Um, so for the games that came after it, um, it had some spin offs, like do the licensing stuff and the Tetris and all that, you know, story uh, from the, you know, the BBC documentary and all of that. Yeah. Um, had some Tetris related games that weren't called Tetris and um, was uh, Flashpoint, which was like a puzzle game. You had like pre pre-filled uh, boards with gems in them and you'd have to like clear stuff down like a sort of thing we'd clear stuff down like clear the gem at the bottom yeah um as fast as you could and there's different levels um that was supposed to have a super tetris mode which was um as far as we can tell going to be the original arcade sega tetris but with a um fuji uh fall you know two rows per frame yeah. like double kill screen um, to make it more profitable for arcade operators, even though that game, even as it is, you know, is and continues to be super profitable anywhere you put it. It's like yeah. a super classic version of the game. Yeah. Um, and then in the follow-up to uh, Block Seed, um, which is a um, sort of a um, Tetromino game with like power-ups and stuff that come out, and you have to like figure out how to work with these different um, bombs and two-ton weights and uh, you know satellites that you can use to shoot minos away or flicky that you can use to shoot minos into the play field like yeah. uh, at different times that one also goes to 2g so it feels like oh back in you know 88 89 we have this idea of making the game twice as fast in this like simple way and then it comes back right now you know it seems like a very like era appropriate thing to put into nes tetris just double yeah. the speed again <laughs> people are playing too long double the speed again yeah yeah and and Everyone that I talked to about double skill thing, they think it is the early end of any establishment, but yeah, we'll never know. I mean, the, the, the scene has changed so much in the last five years that, that I truly don't know what will happen in the next five years. Hopefully, maybe we get some stability or we have another play style invented in, in a couple of years. 
Hmm. Yeah, I mean, that's interesting. I think like we're kind of at the uh, limit with rolling because like what's be better than, uh, you know, 20 hertz, 30 hertz, right? Um, I think, you know, you have stuff like Moja Tap or like other things where people are getting two thumbs in on the D-pad. Yeah. Um, I, what I'm interested in is uh, people figuring out um, grips for rolling. Um, because you know you have stuff like uh, you know jerpy roll looks really um, interesting to me because it's a uh, actually I do have an idea sort of control right here like I think what she does is like she just uh, like does like with um, just like just one hand like she does it there yeah. and then like if she needs a five tap she hits it from the top um, and that's like as a das player and like a traditional grip player that's really attractive to me to be able to still kind of use the same grip and like maybe even das sometimes or then if I need a roll I just you know throw all my four fingers into it if i can figure out the timing for that or like the grip for that that's interesting um um is yeah it something I, I'd be that you to try? see like what different ways that people figure it out yeah is this is something it... i've tried um mm -hmm. i think i like in sort of that era where like you know a lot of the rolling talk was in private chats or dms or like people like trying to see you know is this going to break any s tetris should we reveal it sort of talks or like what can we do with this first is it possible to do this first yeah um i think maybe i think there was like either a clip of jd or um ella or somebody that like was passed around of doing the left hand tap only yeah um, and i tried to do it it's like sometimes you can get something but it just didn't feel as um doable as the methods i was using before which were like weird stuff um you know i was either trying to do the normal grip or um trying to do like it, it was actually funny i, I talked to i um, talk to Matt Martin. Uh, we both kind of independently discovered the teeth tapping thing, <laughs> the cursed, you know, bash it into your face <laughs> method. Um, yeah. yeah. Um, so, yeah, I think at that era um, when people were kind of like secretly doing stuff or like, you know, trying to figure out what works, even if it's cursed, um, there was that, you know, left hand method that was like theorized. But I think Jerpy is one of the only people that um, is actually using that as their main play style. The, the four on the back and the thumb from the top um, yeah. sort of uh, left hand roll. And I like that a lot because I always have a hard time figuring out like how to keep it stable in like bouncing on a leg or, you know, I roll on a dog bone because I use my left hand to do the rolling and I don't want to like learn upside down. I don't want to, you don't really, when you use a normal rectangle controller um, with a left hand roll, like you don't really have a good place to put your fingers. Yeah. Whereas if you play it with a goofy foot um, or backwards type of uh, play style, um, then you have a, a huge like shelf of space to just put your hand on. Yeah. Um, so yeah, the idea of left hand rolling straight up is interesting. Oh, I guess we will return to the conversation. But first, we moved home from YouTube. We are now on the Classic Tetris Monthly YouTube channel, where all our episodes will be available at full length. Join the Classic Tetris Monthly Discord server. Go to ctm.gg slash discord to join the server and participate in one of our monthly tournaments and join the biggest classic tetris discord server if you have a suggestion we need to have on the next piece of fantasy podcast let us know through the socials or on our discord piece of fantasy podcast is also available on spotify itunes google Podcasts, or your favorite podcast app there is also a Peace Dependency YouTube channel. On this channel, you see podcast highlights, mini documentaries, and other NES Tetris related topic videos. You can follow us on the socials at Peace Dependency, and we are active on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. Now, let's go back to the conversation. Oh, I guess if you talk about new play styles, uh, I guess there's also the fun stuff like the uh, Josh Toll's uh, thought experiment, <laughs> if you've seen it, yeah. rolling the uh, cord around your finger really tight to yeah. get a roll shelf. Um, did you hear the story about how he came up with that too? No, no, I haven't. Um, yeah, the story of how he came up with that for at first was, um, he was trying to figure out how rolling at first and he just couldn't do it. And yeah. he was trying to think, okay, well, I just need something to prove to me this works. Um, so what he did was he had a, like a handful of DVD cases. Like, I think he had like a box set from like, I think he said Indiana Jones or something. He just had like a handful of DVDs laying around. So he yeah. put them in like a stair step pattern, like a washboard. And he just like dragged the controller got against it and then got a perfect 30 hertz roll. He's like, oh, oh that's it. I get it. Yeah. Um, and then it, it, from there, it's like, okay, well, I can learn rolling. But then also like, well, what's, what is the rules for the controller policy? Um, am I allowed to use a part of the controller? Am I allowed to remove from the controller? Like yeah. you had this idea of like, what if you cut notches in your controller? Is that allowed? Like, 
what kind of modifications is a modification and like what aspect like is allowed and that raises all these important questions or interesting questions of like well the reason i think a lot of the controller policy stuff was at first was um have everyone on the same playing field because we didn't want people to be able to have some advantage in tapping that other people didn't have yeah and now that we have people hitting 30 hertz on the nes controller you almost have this aspect of like well does it matter that we use an nes controller anymore um will there be an era where just for the aspect of um accessibility or maintenance or any of these other um questions like is it better that we let people use custom controllers eventually like a yeah. lot of other uh, genres of games like fighting games a lot of people to use uh custom controllers as long as they fall within certain um uh guidelines like you can't have a macro button that you know presses a bunch of buttons in a row and like you know puts out a, a combo or something yeah you can't um have you know certain types of um you know input filtering depending on like um which um tournament circuit you're coming to like yeah it has to be this kind of input filtering or that kind of input filtering um and you know if we have certain rule sets we're like okay as long as it falls within these boundaries like you could see a world where maybe it's a good thing that we have um you know we don't have to just go and find any assets controllers or figure out how to perforate them just right or like screw the <laughs> screw in perfectly so you get the uh the role that you're used to uh, maybe annoying, eventually yeah. we'll allow um yeah or even just like for accessibility things not to have to you know figure out these weird grips um to be able to just drum out on a table yeah. style grip um instead of having to bounce on your hand or you know if, if people are having joint issues or any any sort of reasons um maybe eventually we'll see that too you know i who knows um but is it will it then still be any Tetris? like any Tetris to me is playing on a clone console or an original nes but with a rectangle uh with a rectangle uh, controller um i think so uh, i think mechanically everything is still the same concept um we're not talking about um introducing auto fire or, or any das type of play styles uh if we're just talking about well you were able to figure out how to press this button 30 times a second this way um that's the same you know kind of skill like you're not getting any advantage for pressing 30 times a second a different kind of button yeah. um you know the only reason why we had that restriction in the first place was we didn't know what was possible like we didn't want to have somebody be able to tap it way faster than an nes controller that's how yeah. i feel like that spiritually point was to not have somebody come up with some sort of tool or device or something to get a competitive advantage but if it's you know equitable um i don't see any reason why you know we couldn't have you know the same mechanics the same rule set um and just a different type of controller yeah um, i know that there's like a lot of difficult discussions in terms of like okay well what games is it better to allow auto fire versus not um you know i don't really see us breaching that uh conversation anytime soon now that we have like a sort of like more um I guess um achievable way of tapping it doesn't break your hands um yeah. in the same way that vibro tapping could so i'm not really asking for like a huge paradigm shift where it's like okay like let's just allow uh auto fire wholesale and like um like some games do like um in some arcade genres you're allowed to use auto fire like especially in uh, japanese um arcade rule sets yeah. um a lot of those older games same era as nes tetris had a lot of problems where it's like well, we don't really want to break our wrist, you know, pressing the fire button um, yeah. many times per second over an hour or, you know, whatever the game length is. Um, so auto fire became the norm in Japanese arcades. It's just like, well, that's just how the rules of those games were. They hadn't yeah. built that into the game yet in the same way that um, fast dash speeds hadn't caught on in early eras of uh, Tetris. You know, a lot of games were either just using the keyboard repeat rate and didn't have DAS like real or they yeah. would have slow DAS, like NES Tetris, um, as like a game balancing me metric. Um, um, you know, I, like I think the game mechanics really shifted towards just having built in fast auto fire that you couldn't uh, surpass. So, you know, the older games was like, well, yeah, why not just let it be auto fire? Like if the game benefits from it yeah. and some games will have auto fire. Yes. And auto fire, no categories. I guess the NES Tetris version is we have, you know, the CTWC, which is still, you know, you have to roll and you have like some online tournaments like any DAS where you can customize whatever speeds you want to use. Yeah. Um, you know, you could see that kind of aspect uh, coming up too. you know, um, uh, I think, you know, the middle ground is if we have a controller policy where, you know, if you have some sort of hand 
you know, issue, or even just like for the maintenance issue of having to find uh, NES controllers and, you know, maintain them. We just let people use like an arcade button. Um, that doesn't seem too far out of bounds. Um, I know that, you know, a lot of people have, you know, learned how to do the rolling on NES controller, and I think yeah. that's good. I understand why that's like a, you know, breakthrough in skill. Um, but I also think that skill will transfer directly to just rolling on a button anyhow. So it's like, it doesn't feel like necessary to, I guess, restrict it to just that. Yeah. Um, and, you know, that seems like the more conservative thing than, like, I don't think I would ask, like, well, you know, let's fix the game by adding auto fire right away. Like, that's always, like, a discussion of, like, well, does that go too far or not um, for, like, the spirit of the competition that we're going for? Oh, yeah. But, you know, you know, who knows? Like, some speedrun communities have decided that auto fire is fine, like, that they don't, similar to the Japanese scoring communities, that they just don't want to break their hand for something that, mechanically, if they can make the same decisions using auto fire controllers then sometimes that's allowable yeah um a middle ground is at least you know maybe one day we'll see different controllers but or maybe i don't think the, we're there quite yet maybe yeah I, or, it's hard to hard to get engaged in the community or the ground rule what what you should do is one uh, uh input per press like what's what's currently on ctm you can use any mm -hmm. controller you, you like and, and uh, yeah exactly but you have to put one one input is is one press is one input mm -hmm. and not more. So then you can choose yeah, you can't, anything you can't multiple bind. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, I think that's a good metric too. Uh, and CTAM is a good example. Um, I would want to make sure it's just that, um, that those rules are written somewhere. Um, because I'm not sure if they're written on the CTM site yet. And then also that they're, um, I guess, uh, evaluated consistently. I, I know that at one point in time, there was a uh, used to like tap on the type uh, the side of their controller. Uh, side of the controller, side of their mouse. Yeah, and I think there was sort of this like feeling about mouse clicks that I guess there was a perception that that was easier to tap on than um, keyboard keys or um, NES um, buttons. So like even though it was following that controller policy of you know single binds and um, you know um, not having auto fire or all these things, and they weren't mouse wheeling. Like the thing that I always thought when I heard that. Uh, mouse wasn't allowed was that oh like if you bind mouse wheel up and mouse wheel down and like just like spin it yeah uh, unlock to get a roll side yeah that doesn't seem like it's the same as uh the same spirit uh as you know individual inputs i can understand not allowing you know analog to digital conversion or like you yeah. know, spin wheels and things um but no it was just you know the side the buttons on the side of his mouse he like tapping on okay i'm sorry um that felt like it um should be allowed if it wasn't that point in time it should be allowed now at least with the way that i understand the ctm rule set um well you can you can get 30 hertz and and that's what all mm -hmm. pro rollers can can achieve too it was banned at yeah. that time because there was no legal like rolling wasn't invented so hyper -tapping. the best hyper sure. can get like 20 max but consistent like 15 hertz and if you go like 30 hertz, like, yeah, that's that's not something what you can do on an original controller. And now we know we can roll on an original controller. So yeah. a, a mouse uh, should be legal for, for online play. Yeah. Yeah, I think so. I, I think, um, yeah, that makes sense, too. Like, I kind of was trying to think about it. Um, I think it just gets hard to navigate like what is too good, quote unquote, for single tapping at that point. Like if we're allowing people to play on the emulator and we're allowing people to use uh, keyboards or this or that or whatever they want to use, like it seems a little bit odd to have a like, oh, but this is too good kind of rule. Yeah. You know, now that there's not even a question, like people can just achieve that on normal controllers and keyboards anyway. That's why I feel like, well, you don't really have to have these rules that are based on around like trying to figure out what is quote unquote too good. It's like, well, the, the cat is out of the bag. People can do that regardless of what input device we have. Yeah. Um, you don't really even have to have that conversation anymore. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, during CGWC this year, you got the Lifetime Achievements Award. And you are the second recipient of that award. The first one was Chris Tang. Mm -hmm. When did you find out that you won that award or that you or received that award? That weekend, um, Vince gave me like a little bit of a heads up to kind of, you know, try to prepare some ideas of like what I would, uh, what I would, you know, try to talk about and, you know, still came out a little bit rambly in my opinion, but, uh, the, <laughs> I, you know, felt like I was able to at least address some of, uh, I guess a lot of the influences and like a lot of things that I've 
been happy to be part of this community to you know contribute toward or you know watch and un unfold yeah um, um i think chris found out a bit sooner before he uh, went up on stage <laughs> uh chris chris has a I guess the commentary chops to have a little bit of a better time uh, doing a uh, more extemporaneous uh, speech like that. Uh, but yeah, I think it's just one of those things where um, as things go on, uh, you know, more and more people will be brought into the fold of, uh, you know, who's um, he been there for the long haul and like contributed toward it. I, I think I'm interested to, you know, I guess contribute toward figuring out who to um, like be part of that panel of like uh, who will receive and things like that we'll keep on you know seeing um how this community grows and you know yeah. we can you know how we can all like support each other yeah it's it's truly fitting that we that we got it right now like cwc turns 15 15th edition next year and uh the first year back from the pandemic uh, from the pandemic era uh, the first recipient of the award chris Tang, now you were you surprised that you uh, that you were received that award um, yeah, I mean, I certainly wasn't, uh, expecting something, um, coming into it. Um, I, I feel honored to, um, to receive it and to, to be recognized in that way. I guess I feel honored that, um, you know, the stuff that I've just been doing as, I guess, you know, sort of, um, the things I found interesting or the hobby or the, you know, the game that I really wanted to support this community and, you know, the, the various Tetris communities, um, be able to, I guess, contribute toward that and yeah. um, be part of that has always been uh, an honor already to me. And so, um, yeah, when Vince said that I was going to be receiving it, I, I felt, yeah, just uh, it's just an honor to be there and to to be part of it all. Yeah, you're like a walking ex and oh my god, <laughs> a walking knowledge book. Like you know so yeah. much about any <laughs> Tetris, you know so much about uh, Tetris Grandmaster and and all various Tetris. Mm -hmm. Like we we talked about the licenses and all that. How do you gather mm -hmm. all that knowledge and and what fascinates you about Tetris so much that you want to gather all that knowledge? Um, I mean, I guess um, I guess there's a lot of different angles to it. Um. One is um, just, I mean, the games are mechanically interesting in themselves, right? Like part of the playing the game is just the puzzle of playing the game or understanding how it works and how you can best um, leverage that to your advantage to, you know, whether that's, you know, understanding how DAS works in NES or like how, you know, you can combine actions in TGM to, you know, fling things over this way or that way or, you know, walk over um, gaps and things. Uh, there's like this aspect of like, well, Part of the game is just the puzzle of it itself and understanding how it works and understanding how to control things and like what decisions you can make based on how everything works. Yeah. So like it's that's like puzzle genre in general. Um, so yeah, just puzzles are cool. Um, programming is cool. So I guess there's like a dual aspect <laughs> of understanding it from the puzzle game aspect and understanding it from the programming aspect. Like how is this implemented? How does this work? Yeah. How can we change this with game genie codes? You know, all of that is interesting. Um, and then I guess also just, I guess, the uh, game history aspect, um, because there's a lot of history behind how these games were um, developed or, you know, licensed or um, the legal debates and like who, you know, decided what for what reasons um, um, and you yeah. know, how that affected development, you know, who ends up developing these versions in different regions. Um, and also, like, I guess the stories that weren't uh, told as often about a lot of this stuff um, because I think you know you hear the story of Tetris and you have this like really narrow slice of what happened around a licensing discussion in the late 80s and you don't have a lot of what happened around that and you don't have a lot of documentation about what happened in other eras um, yeah. so it's a lot of stuff that a lot of people just don't know like oh like um, what happened to you know the home versions of TGM that were planned for PlayStation or PlayStation 2. Um, what happened to those discussions? Like, why were those um, not successful? Yeah. Um, what happened to TGM 4? Um, what happened to prototypes and different versions of games that, you know, came out on this platform versus that? Um, uh, I think there's just a lot of um, conversations around that, that or, like, or even like um, the... Um, 
how it, Sega Tetris got made and how it's influenced by the um, Spectrum Holobyte version of the game that came out on yeah. um, home computers at the time and the things that it changes about it, like how it, you know, iterated up upon like what version that Steve Hanawa saw at the offices where he was going for, um, you know, the, I think like what, Sega Master System version of Monopoly and he yeah. happens to see Tetris because there's a version they're making there and then he tells the, you know, Sega of Japan about this game and then a you know, figure out the licensing in terms of like whatever the licensing was understand at the time and, uh, you know, make Sega Tetris for the arcades and it's the smash hit and it's like basically a better, like more refined version of Spectrum Heilbyte's version of Tetris. Like there's all these like family tree and like influences and things that you can see about how stuff develops over time. There's like way more untold stories about these versions of the game um, than what you see in just one BBC documentary or um, a, you know, YouTube video that, uh, recounts yeah. the BBC documentary or game over, you know, like we, there's more to still discover and, and to have document. And, and in um, some extent, you know, the, or, the Tetris movie. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. I was just going to say, or, you know, mistold in the form of the Tetris movie. Right. And yeah. that's just a, a disservice, I guess, to um, have to punch something up that, you know, yeah, that's going to be a lot of people's um, only understanding of the story and some of it just completely made up. Right. And, you know, obviously it's a Hollywood movie or whatever, like, or like, no, I guess not. Well, I don't know what we would call it. You know, it comes out on Apple TV, you know, streaming movie. Uh, <laughs> I yeah. don't know. Mm -hmm. May, uh, instead of going uh, direct to DVD, it's direct to streaming. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah. It's just uh, be people's only understanding of something. Sometimes that can, you know, affect how people, understand it's already it's already a limited story when it's just one documentary or one book yeah or one something and then if you mistell it in the form of a movie um then you're only just like pigeonholing things further into like sort of a misapplication of the narrative yeah um which you know i was like less interesting to me there's still more interesting stories to be told about this or that or or the you know the Genesis version of Tetris that was supposed to come out and then couldn't because of all this licensing discussion oh you know Nintendo has the home license now. Yeah. Um, you can't make that version of the game, that sort of thing. Um, some of it's told, but I'm sure not all of it. Um, or, you know, figuring out who the programmers of NES Tetris were, which we have a pretty good idea of now just because of, like, by happenstance, um, we know who programmed a lot of those puzzle games at the time. Like, we yeah. see the patent application for Dr. Mario, and we know um, that uh, who's credited as the, I guess, game designer for Game Boy Tetris in a magazine. So it's likely that that's the same person who programmed it for the NES version. Um, but, you know, we're, you know, missing a lot of that history that, like, I think we need to try to, you know, see yeah. you know, who's still around. Um, who can we, you know, even if we have to figure out, you know, some Japanese translation or something, like, who can we still interview and try to learn more of this history? Or, yeah. or even, like, from the, you know, perspective of developers that made versions of Tetris that ended up not winning the license in the end, right? Like the Spectrum Holobyte version. Yeah. Um, that, well, I, I guess they kind of were able to continue making that. Um, they did continue to work with, uh, I guess, Alexi and uh, Blue Planet. Not Blue Planet. Different yeah. things like that. Um, they did make some other Tetris versions. But yeah, it's like finding more development stories from the people that were like in that kind of chaotic period. Yeah. So officially, we don't know who made any of Tetris. Um, yeah, I mean, it's not like there's any, um, credit in the game. Um, but we know like through happenstance and a lot of like, I guess, information that, um, we have from a Game Boy magazine, um, information that, uh, Masao Yamamoto was credited as the, um, I guess, uh, designer is what he said as, um, for Game Boy Tetris. Yeah. And he is a programmer, and he also is on the patent for Dr. Mario, and he's like credited with like a lot of other, um, I guess, uh, programming in uh, Nintendo R&D one at that time, including some of the other puzzle games. Um, so I, I think um, I think it's very likely that since you know it's pretty clear that NES Tetris is sort of like a on a lot of the design around Game Boy Tetris that it's likely him or a collaborator that worked on the programming for um, NES Tetris also. Yeah. So I think it's one of those things like we need to confirm things, but since we have a lot of like like circumstantial information about like which teams worked on what, 
or you know other information well like this person worked on these puzzle games they worked on dr mario and they worked on game boy tetris like this is the middle point of that yeah he probably also programmed um nes tetris that sort of thing or like programming that's similar those sort of things um but you know it's things that we need to nail down right we it would be better if we had an interview and could say like did you work on this or yeah. um uh you know or ask you know another colleague like uh hip tanaka is known to be the um composer and you know sound effect designer for um game boy tetris and nes tetris and like a lot of that other era of uh, nintendo games you know you could if you could get a contact to hip tanaka and be like hey um do you remember who you worked with um on the other aspects of programming yeah for the game game programming and get a confirmation that way too um so yeah, i think we need to like start you know figuring out like well who can we contact what's the best way to converse with them and um get information about the history of some of these games that's like sort of at the time like more under wraps like you know there weren't always credits in games so yeah it, it's fascinating mm -hmm. that's one of the biggest games uh on on the nes that we don't know who made it like who were the developers of it mm -hmm. we, we we know that nintendo made the game as the company and had the licensee and that uh alexi created tetris but mm -hmm. that we that we have no clue who made the game yeah, um, it's really interesting. I, I think just that, um, sometimes in that era, um, you know, there was maybe concerns about poaching, you know, like uh, other companies getting um, employees from other ones if they knew who they were. So sometimes you'd have games that were full of, you know, pseudonyms or nicknames um, or, you know, might not have credits at all. Um, I yeah. don't know exactly what the case in Nintendo was, but um, or also, like I, you know, I know for um, some companies of that era too, like, you know, I guess sort of in the... Uh, Atari era, you know, like before all this stuff was, you know, a little bit more um, nailed down and um, allowed to be talked about, you know, um, that they like started celebrating some of their game designers or programmers more, um, that they felt like it was a company product in some cases. Yeah. Um, and so it was like, well, you know, you don't put a, a credit on like this or that if it's just like a game or a toy or something that the company owns. Yeah. I'm not really sure what the case would be for Nintendo. I, I haven't really looked into that too far yet um but i i do know um that we're able to sort of like fill in the gaps in some cases like you know we have the patent for dr mario or sometimes you'll have somebody go and do a presentation and they'll put it in their you know history yeah um that that's also an interesting aspect of like um there are some tetris games that are designed by um um is like underwriting companies, or like a ghost writing companies, I guess. Like, I don't know what you call yeah. it. Like, I guess like ghost developers, um, like Tose. Um, I think Tose did the programming for like some of the Super Famicom Tetris games, like uh, Tetris Battle Guide. And I'll have to double check on that later, so don't quote me on it. But I think that was confirmed by um, a Tose um, presentation where they had a big photo of a bunch of cartridges. And like, these are our projects. Like, yeah. at the time, they weren't saying that they had made it. Um, since it was like developed, you know, in conjunction with um, conjunction with Nintendo or conjunction with uh, BPS or whatever the case may be, yeah, uh, there are some cases like that where there's ghost developers who worked on these games too, and you just have to find it out through the grapevine later. Like, oh, they made a presentation, or they have like a slide deck, or they have a photo somewhere. It's like this is part of our design history. Yeah, um, when at the time it was just contract work. Is uh, is not knowing who made NES Tetris? Is that the biggest mystery to the game, or is there more to the game that we don't know? Um. Well, I think that being able to potentially um, interview who made um, a version might answer some questions for us, like how much of this was by design and how much of this was by accident. Because there's a lot of things where you look at it, and you're like, well, the math for how you can max out before um, the kill screen works out way too well um and there's some things that also it's like that's obviously a bug but did you leave it in intentionally or not have time to fix it like for example um you know the stuff where if you start on certain levels instead of getting to the uh level 29 at 290 lines you get to it at 230 lines that's because of a, a bug in the math where it compares like one kind of number to another without a conversion yeah um but it balances the game too well it's like it's so strange that um you know, you can start on level nine or eighteen or nineteen and have about roughly the same uh, likelihood of being able to max out, right? Yeah. Just based on um, you know, what you'll be able to get by the nineteen transition. Yeah. Um, 
that math is so intriguing and it's like well did you look at that and be like oh we'll leave it in because we don't have time to fix it or did you look at it and like actually that's kind of nice like this happy accident of how these things worked or like how das worked in certain aspects like how much of that was on purpose and how much was an accident that's the only stuff that you can kind of know for sure if you're able to ask the person and know if they remember it or not yeah uh, and just be like hey like how much of you know the randomizer like why did you do it this way or in that way like there's like interesting stuff you could learn from that so we know a lot about the game like uh, uh, a lot of people within the community have devoted that time towards the game or what's the game mechanic mm -hmm. and 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 more but knowing what the game is doesn't mean that we know why these decisions has has been mm -hmm. made right yeah yeah there's there's some there's some rationale and things that you know would be interesting to know about like why did you choose to do this in this version or that version because there's like we have like three related versions well no i guess right four like you've got Game Boy tetris and you've yeah. got nes tetris ntsc you've got nes tetris pal like who handled that conversion and why did they decide to you know do the math this way versus that way yeah. and then you have tetris versus doctor uh, not versus tetris and dr mario for the super nintendo um and it's also um you know like a remixed version of nes tetris in a lot of ways and there's differences in how um diagonal dropping works in that game there's a little bit of pre-gravity before each piece yeah. um the scoring caps at level nine why is that you know the randomizers redone you know like there's all sorts of like things like well like, what was the like process of deciding to make what changes you did like for programming or game design reasons like over these like four related versions of the game yeah so how much mm -hmm. time do you devote to all this investigation or or other investigations um, like in, in 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 tetris generally uh i guess it's like i is as they strike me or as like the need arises i suppose yeah um like a lot of the um into the programming and stuff that i did like before anyone else was kind of doing too much of that i mean well i mean i guess that's not true like i can think of examples of having people having dug into the programming before because there's uh obviously like full assisted speed runs and stuff that predate me trying to figure out stuff about nes tetris yeah that had figured out stuff about how the randomizer works in order to get those uh perfect you know l and j pieces uh manipulated to get um triples at the top of the screen to turn yeah. them into tetrises like those kind of bugs and things um so yeah i wouldn't say i was you know the first one to dig into a lot of stuff but there was a lot of stuff that wasn't documented when i got into the game yeah um there was um you know das wasn't documented perfectly like you know that we knew how fast it was when you used it but not that you could you know keep it between pieces the way that you could yeah um except for you know the players that had figured it out intuitively but there's a lot of you know i guess like technical or rule stuff wasn't written down so that's like an example of like I don't know, I find a need for something and it's like, okay, well, I'm going to pull out that thread and then pull out that thread and pull out the thread until I've, you know, satiated that curiosity or, you know, learned what I need to know to know what I need to know. Um, so I, I wouldn't say it's like I dedicate specific time. It's like more about if I've, you know, got time some weekend or evening or, you know, there's something that I feel like needs to be known, I'll try to look into it and see if yeah. it is known or if it can be figured out. Yeah. Cool. So it, it feels like that you slowly worked your way up within like the general uh, uh, Tetris uh, uh, scene. Uh, you're, you're a moderator mm -hmm. on the subreddit of Tetris. Um, I think a moderator on Tetris Concepts. Uh, you have your own Kitaro Cave in, in this DTM server. Uh, do you get daily questions like, how does this work? How does that work? Yeah, um, small small correction. I'm no longer a Redditor. Uh, I, uh, oh. Left that subreddit after the uh, the protests because I just don't want to use Reddit anymore. Oh yeah. Um, I uh, wish well to the people that are still moderating it. It was one of those things where it's like I just don't feel good giving my free labor to that site anymore after a lot of the changes that they made um, yeah. to the detriment of people with accessibility concerns or moderators. Um, we we had sort of a discussion that time where it was understandable that we weren't going to be able to make change, so it was a matter of allowing moderators that wanted to continue on to. Um, able to support the community that was still there um yeah. and you know i wasn't going to keep it locked down if we couldn't do anything about it but yeah. i because we were trying to figure out like what do we do in this you know some people are protesting some people are not i decided the best way for me to do that was to leave um moderating the site oh yeah it was just stressing me out <laughs> <laughs> the whole thing yeah um yeah. 
So although I can't uh, contribute that knowledge to that site anymore, um, I don't have problems with people, you know, posting links and stuff to it if if they have an explanation that they find from me. Um, I also don't have a problem with, uh, you know, I de yeah, I definitely, you know, get questions on other sites. I, uh, you know, keep an eye on the Kataru Cave or hard drop questions when I've got time. I try to answer uh, what kind of stuff that people might want to know about things. Um, if I'm able to write things down into one explanation that I can link to people later, I try to do that sometimes. Um, yeah, yeah I, I'm, I'm just glad to be around to be able to, I guess, uh, share and collectively build a lot of that information. You know, there's a lot that we can learn from talking about what we know and then also learning from either what other people want to know or what people know and that are able to like, you know, yeah. build that collective mind share up. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, and also that's maybe people ask questions that you never thought about and that maybe that results, uh, if you, if you look into that question, the results something a little bit of about the puzzle. Um, yeah, I mean, so do you mean like in terms of like uh, having stuff that's um, accessible online, like searchable, or like uh, yeah. how do you mean? Yeah, like mm -hmm. uh, you you made uh, uh, like you have so much knowledge, like the, the, in the in the Tetris wiki and all that, and and all the knowledge mm -hmm. that you gathered uh, over all the years. But like you like you mentioned, you have certain questions that you want to answer, uh, like uh, the Tetris scan master for the piece uh, piece one, uh, the Tetris. Tetris Grandmaster 4 and all that, who made NES Tetris, like, mm -hmm. is it helpful if people think with you that they know, like, okay, maybe this is a question that you need to answer, and then you look into that question and like, oh, yeah, that's, that was, that was what the question should be. Yeah, it's interesting. Yeah, there's like a, a lot of a dialogue, I guess, right? Like, sometimes you'll be looking for an answer, or sometimes you'll find a question, right? Like, sometimes you'll think something is the way it is, or like, have some idea about it, but then you might learn something along the way. Um, yeah, it's yeah, it's. It, I think that's a big aspect of the the research and history is like it's. Uh, there's a lot of different perspectives to look at something, um, and you never know really exactly what you'll find along the way or like what you'll you know be able to document. Um, so it's just a matter of like being able to um, find a lot of that information out there and like to try to I guess uh, synthesize it. Yeah, uh, and also yeah to to document where. Um, it can be publicly searchable is important too. Like I, I definitely need to go back and try to, you know, edit the wiki more or like write more stuff, um, you know, on, you know, like a personal blog or, you know, something of that sort. Um, that, that's why a lot of, you know, that's why I'm really sad about a lot of platforms um, either becoming closed or being closed in the first place. Like yeah. um, um, Twitter is really hard to search now or like, uh, cause you can't really Google it anymore. You can only see, um, single pages without being logged in. Um, yeah. If, and if Twitter search ever goes down, you know, we're gonna lose a lot of stuff where like a lot of um, game developers um, and um, a lot of, you know, other historical resources, like people will just talk about stuff on there. They'll just talk about their time in the industry and they'll just talk about and like post uh, concept art or this or that. And like, we might be able to catch some of it, but sometimes it's hard to catch all of it. And yeah. um, the most important thing is just to, like, make sure it's documented somewhere, have a copy of it, um, try to put stuff in internet archive, you know, way back machine it. Um, yeah, I, I think, um, and also discord is really tough too, because it's a very unsearchable, like it's not part of the public web. You have all these different servers, which act like in the same way that uh, little IRC chats would. Right. Yeah. Um, but they're harder to log. Like they're sort of self logging. Um, Whereas in the you know old times you would have to like if you were in an IRC chat you would have to have your own text logs that like whenever you or like a um, if you had like a bouncer server or something you would be logging all the chats from there yeah um, but now Discord um, although you get the convenience of that being handled by a third party um, all the search and the logging and everything yeah um, you can also lose access to it um, sometimes uh, you know a community will get banned or a user will get banned. Um, and maybe not for a good reason um, yeah. or um you know i, I know we have a, <laughs> a tetris player who like may have been like in a like emote server or something and then that server got banned because people were like um you know doing some thing against discord ts and that and they, they lost their account and like yeah um i won't name name names but uh you know i'm, I'm just gonna say i'm a fan <laughs> maybe that'll uh you know perk per yeah. some ears um you know that's that's tricky um yeah. uh, and also just the fact that even if, you know, everything's above board um, and you don't lose your accounts and, you know, stuff is still all searchable, you have to be in the server like that. You can't search that on Google and, um, True. you know, um, 
when we leave these forum or blog communities, or if you know people leave Reddit because it's like hard to use now, or like or um, you know they can't use it anymore because they don't have an accessible client, or like whatever reasons, um, or if you know Twitter falls apart, we actually like lose a lot of uh, content or ability to share that content. Yeah, um, it, it's we have a lot of eggs in single baskets right now, and that makes me a little bit uh, worried or sad sometimes. Yeah, is that what the NES doctor should do more, like lock? uh most of our knowledge that we have and not clock it up in all the discord servers um i think it's like the right tool for the right uh task i think the great thing about discord is that it's a self-service way to be able to create a chat and to be able to have these like active live conversations yeah um what i want to make sure happens more often too is that it's able to get out to these um external resources like for example i i think it's a nice step that uh, ctm.gg has a um text log of all of the game genie codes that um were previously hosted in the inside of the discord server yeah. the like the codes and rom hacking channel um you know had all these game genie codes but now they're out they're in the site it's easy to go and look at it and the same yeah. with like wikis um updating wikis or um making sure that if you've got a rom um hack that's done and you want to release it and make sure that you know that it's not just through discord downloads if you've got something that's like really complete that it's on romhacking.net or um some place where people can access it yeah um yeah um and also um another really great project i want to shout out is um what marfram and uh company have been doing with um updating the liquipedia or uh, tetris yeah there's a uh um a sub wiki as part of the whole liquipedia you know umbrella for Tetris and all sorts of Tetris. It's like any sort of tournament, whether it's uh, NES Tetris or uh, TGM or um, Guideline or Guideline adjacent. Um, what are all the results that we can record for that? And what is the history of the formats of these tournaments? Yeah. And um, what the prize winnings that people got? And um, that's a, another part of the history too. There's a lot of places where we can um, record these things, yeah. I used to... Uh, do my research and then uh, when I interview a player, I go to the, to the classic Tetris match database. But that's that's broken. Like uh, they are working mm. on a on a new match database, but the 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 old one on the spreadsheet. That sometimes Google can be f very funky. But last episode, I had Miles Degrees on the show. That was the first time that I really used Wikipedia to gather information and. All the major tournaments were that perfectly organized, so I could walk through the career of Miles and then know which round he got and uh, uh, what the losing score was. And if I wanted some more information on on the tournament, could click on the tournament. It was so easy, and it saved me so much time doing research. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, the guys that have been doing that editing have been doing a fantastic job because, like. Being able to understand those, um, you know, storylines or statistics, and being able to, you know, weave that into our understanding of things today—that's um, huge. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I'm glad that we have an early start onto it to um, not lose much of that history. I mean, like it's a young enough game where we're able to keep a lot of that. Um, I'm, I'm not going to say that there's, you know, not stuff that we don't know about. I mean, I'm sure that, like, you know, some games have tournaments or like little events that we'll have to like still fish up and try to understand about while there's still time or if we can still you know find like i know there's like little like uh tetris and dr mario leagues and stuff yeah um, you know like local scenes um, that would be interesting to have documented in some way and make sure that you know at the very least that we know where to find those uh way back machine um archive links and be able to say like hey like not only do we have this current history but also like here's like little local scenes um i also know around the time of ctwc um Somewhere in San Francisco, at some little bar or venue, there was a uh, like a little league that they had there too, or like one day tournaments, and those are yeah. like those are interesting to know about too. Um, just to know like what was the history of com competition before it like became formalized, and like how has it grown since then? Yeah, I think um, we know. I think even Dana. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Um, I was just gonna finish that off with the thought that I, I think even Dana mentioned that um, she played at some sort of like bar NES Tetris tournament at some point in time. So you yeah. know, I, I wonder about those little mini things or like anime conventions or like packs or whatever, sometimes yeah. they have little things here and there too. I think we know about 90 to 95% of all matches mm -hmm. and tournaments that happened since 2010. At, at Chris Forrest did a lot of work on it. Uh, uh, Rory uh, did a lot of work for it. Now Pumpy Heart does a lot of work for mm -hmm. it. Just 
everything that happens out from yeah yeah mm -hmm. goes into the goes into the match database and then it will be converted to a brand new match database but it's still mm -hmm. wondering if you look at it like that it's played here and there like and that only the online scene just really started happening December 2017 was the first CTL masses, but really started happening in 2018 and especially in 2019 when CTL came up, so Classic Tetris Gauntlet came up, Classic Tetris Brawl. Mm -hmm. So it's really, like you said, it's it's a 35-year-old game, but the online scene, it's pretty young. Like, yeah, the fact that CTWC springs up in 2010 and, you know, the CTM kind of uh, in the years after that, um, we're, we're able to capture a lot of that, like this era, I guess, of competitive history because we got a start on it soon enough, right? Yeah. I think there's a lot of understanding that, um, you know, sometimes you don't know what history you need to capture while it's happening. Yeah. Um, but I think we had enough sense to like know what history has been, has disappeared before to, I guess, um, try to record enough of it. Um, and, um, you know, we might not have every bit of, um, History, every bit of footage in all the cases, but I, I'm glad that we have as much as we do. Yeah, that we can you know keep uh, keep that up. So I want to go back to your playing career because we talked a lot about a lot mm -hmm. a lot of your other interests in in Tetris. But like we mentioned, you went to CDRC, uh basically from 2010 to 2019. You didn't qualify in 2010 and did a, uh, did qualify from 2011 to 2019 uh, back to back all the time. Um, then. Uh, uh, the world got in lockdown, there was a pandemic and you didn't play anything online like in NES Tetris competitive wise until your CGWC 2020 uh, online qualifier. Why was it that you mm -hmm. didn't play online? Um, I think just um, like I kind of said before like NES Tetris just had been my like once a year kind of game yeah. Like I, I play a lot of different games um, for different achievements or, you know, times or scores or whatever. And um, so, you know, if I had time to play, like, you know, because, you know, there's also other things to juggle in life and uh, work and whatever. Yeah. Um, <laughs> if I had time to play, I think just a lot of the time I was playing stuff other than NES. Yeah. And I wasn't sure, like, when I would have time to, like, dedicate, like, oh, like, right like I will be able to schedule and like have time to do this at that time. Like I felt like it was easier for me to do things a little bit more free flowing of like, if I have time, I'll work on a score in this game or I'll, you know, get online and play something like more, I guess, like free form. Yeah. Um, but um, yeah, I think just uh, Cetris, I was, you know, satisfied with that being my once a year game. Like I had done some stuff like some of the Ben Mullen tiny chat tournaments and things before. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I just I didn't have the same drive to be like, okay, like this is a thing that I'm gonna do outside of you know the Portland trips and outside of um, you know something where like I might need to like schedule it. I don't know. That's just yeah. how kind of how it worked out. Um, I think I also, like I said before, had a lot of TGM stuff to chase still in certain yeah. terms of Tetris. So that that was more what I was uh, focused on. So there there was a chance that you didn't even would attempt to qualify for CWC in in the online era. I felt like CTWC, like I, that was just the event. Like that was the one where I would, you know, spend that time. Like I, it's not that I don't want to play any NES Tetris or like wouldn't, you know, come back to it for CTWC. Yeah. Um, I like to, you know, you know, now at this point, um, I've tried to qualify for every event, um, whether it's online or in person. So I felt like, oh yeah, I'll definitely still play the online and see how it goes. Yeah. That still felt like something that was like part of my, you know, yearly routine. Yeah, uh, I wasn't gonna pass it up. Yeah. So you played two matches in uh, 2021 and in 2022, both mm -hmm. uh, in uh, against Sharky and against Jeff Moore, and then this mm -hmm. year um, you played a very big commitment, like a best of 99 match against Jeff mm -hmm. Moore and King ha we had on the show talked a little bit about it but what made you decide that you wanted to uh to do the best of 99 um you no know, i don't know um i i think 
King asks you, and he he tells a good storyline, right? He's got the reason for asking the players that he's got to ask. So it, it kind of makes you want to feel like, yeah, sure, that does sound like fun. I like playing with Jeff. Like, yeah. Jeff is a local, um, and Jeff's a good guy. And uh, we, you know, are both DAS players. There's like a, you know, a little bit of a com- competition that we can have, you know, just like sort of friendly rivalry. Like, we, why, why not? Like, and that seems yeah. like a good opportunity to practice. Whereas, you know, sometimes I'll, you know, down to the wire, you know, like the last, you know, week or like month or whatever. It's like, oh, what time do I have on what weekends or like, you know, evenings to play this game? I was like, okay, well, if if what I'm being asked is to spend a bit of time some Wednesday evenings um, to play a game, you know, yeah. sure, I, I could do that. Streamed on Twitch. I'll, sure, I'll, I'll go for it. It just seems like a, a fun thing to do. Is it something that that triggers you? Like, okay, maybe next year for CTWC, uh, uh, let me do ctm or let me do ctl that you can kind of control like when you when you play but you don't have the best of 99 commitment but you still will play online and get a little bit of competition experience before you go to ctwc um it would be smart to do that probably if i was going to uh focus more on playing the game um so i guess um you know the same way like even if i'm not doing a competition um to sit down and you know roll more than just like oh i'm done with a best of 99 stream let me try rolling some again and see how it goes or like you know oh like i have a best of 99 thing this week let me you know swap some das and roll games let me play some 19s and go for a max or whatever yeah um yes that would be uh i think the intelligent thing to do if i had the (laughs) the uh conception of trying to do more with any etc but i think it's just one of those things where like if the time comes, if the mood strikes me, if that's the thing that I want to focus my achievements toward, yeah. then yeah, I will do maybe do more of that. Or even if it's not a competition, maybe it's coming up with like the same way that uh, you know Green Tea had like the virtual Green Tea, virtual Corian, you know that system yeah. of like um, coming up with a uh, similar format. Like th- that was what I used to do for CTWC was like uh, I'd keep spreadsheets of my like okay like I've got like a month whatever to play. Let me see what my um, rolling averages are. Like yeah. I would play it, you know, re- no resets, and I would record every score, good or bad, in a yeah. spreadsheet. And um, in a similar sort of way to how like uh, Tetris Grandmaster Three has this sort of uh, system where, in order to get um, the GM grade, you have to promote your account. Like you have to play up to an average that shows like you're consistently getting good grades, and then like. Um, get like qualified grades it's like almost like taking like black belt tests like you have to work your way up and like take these uh, exams where it's like okay you have shown you can play at least this score get this score in this game in one shot right yeah um so in a similar way like since it has this rolling average to determine um when to hand you out these exams i'm like okay i will try to play any asetris and i will keep track of my rolling average and some qualifier formats were like that too like sometimes they'll do like average of two or average of three um, mine was like uh, best four of seven um, and like see what that score is and try to raise that score over time. And oh, that's yeah. still a way to be like, okay, I'm not going to reset games and I'm going to try to keep raising this average. It's another metric to try to try for. Like, so yeah. you, when you get to the competition that you're playing in a way that you would um, all the time, it's just like trying to get max outs every time. If you can't, like if that seed is not quite working out, yeah. still trying to raise that, um, you know, get 700, 800 it's live you know, live through the game, right? <laughs> so it's, it's it's getting more difficult to qualify for CGWC, like for the gold bracket, we had a two max out cutoff. For the silver brackets, I can't even remember what the cutoff score was, but it was like six or 700k score. Um, is it is it then still something, okay, that for the coming years you go to CGWC because you go every year and you go to meet the community and have a fun time? Or is there still a little bit of competitive side in you that you think I want to make one of the brackets or I want to do well in the Legends tournament? Um, yeah, I mean, um, I tried my best to qualify how I could. Um, and I felt like just with my max out consistency, like I have like maybe like four max outs ever at this point. Like I have a lot of one offs. Yeah. Um, but it's just a game that if I wanted to play more and if I wanted to have a better chance of like, you know, not having like a like small dice roll chance of getting into silver or gold, then yeah, you need the max out. Yeah. Um, 
if you want to get into gold, you need more of them. And if you wanted to be in gold and really get far, you would need a roll. So it's like, I know that there's these things that if I decide that I want to have a further run into that kind of event, there's more sort of practice regimens or more like all stuff that I would need to do to do that. Yeah. Um, and so maybe it could happen at some point. Like I have this um, intent to continue to attend and to continue to at least put myself in to qualify and see what I get into. And, you know, if I've been practicing, um, you know, whether it's like, you know, sparring with Jeff Moore this year or like whatever else that form that might take um, to try to play in Legends, yeah, I will continue to do that. Um, yeah. I guess I just don't know yet, um, given the other things that I still want to do in other versions of Tetris or other games entirely that aren't puzzle games, yeah. um, whether that will, um, like, whether that will or what, like, time that will strike that'll be like, okay, like, now I want to go further into NES Tetris, I yeah. just am not sure. But it could happen. It's it's one of those things I hold out this like understanding that I could decide to put more time into it. It, it all depends on the mood that you feel. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's like, because um, it's also like not like I've exhausted the things that I like want to do in any Tetris. Like yeah. I want to get a um, max um, from nineteen. Um, with DAS would be nice. Like I get some scores that are like you know into that like um, eight hundred or nine hundred area sometimes. Like uh, I think practicing not for um pwc but i think for last year's ctwc yeah. um i think is when i got in pb and it's like i don't know 9 30 or something it's like you know within like two of being able to max and that yeah. would be nice to do uh but yeah it's just like do i feel like is that the game that i want to do right now or not and that's yeah. just kind of swaps around depending on what's going on <laughs> hey so my last question for you is what are your specific goals for 2024 uh, for 2024, um, like in terms of, uh, Tetris or games yeah. or, um, yeah, Tetris, what kind of stuff? Tetris wise. Tetris. Yeah. Tetris wise. We're still a Tetris um, podcast after all. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, there's like Tetris adjacent stuff where it's like, um, you know, what I, yeah, is the goal might be, it might, it, mostly it's anything related, mostly it's anything related to Tetris. It's okay. As long as it's bounded to Tetris, that, yes. that makes sense. <laughs> Not necessarily always playing. Okay. I haven't um, played well then, in a um, year, <laughs> so hmm. so and I'm yeah, still I'm um, still hosting a podcast, so it's it's fine. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, in terms of, so we'll start with playing. Yeah. Um, I need to get my act together and get my TGM three kit fixed. TGM three still doesn't have a home version, and my uh, USB security plug died. That's Ooh. an unfortunate aspect of this game, is it has a encryption system and um. In order to have everything, you know, completely legit and above board, um, I need that key to work. Yeah. And it burnt out. Um, and so I need to send it to uh, Taito Tech in Japan to fix it. And I haven't done that yet because that would involve, uh, you know, figuring out how to pack it and, uh, you know, um, send it off. And, you know, how do I pay, you know, whatever, you know, remittance to, you know, the bank account or like what what format do they want me to pay them and all that. Yeah. So I need to email those guys again. So I want to fix that. Because I want to play TGM3 again, because um, I still have one mode to finish. Um, I need to complete um, Shirase mode with a uh, classic rotation rule. Yeah. Because um, TGM3 has classic rotation rule, which is like the like slightly modified TGM rotation. Yeah. And then they've got uh, world rule, which is like um, the guideline rotation, like Tetris Worlds and Tetris 99 and all of that sort of thing. Yeah. And so I've completed uh, Shirase with uh, like Shirase is like sort of like the like death mode or like you know, you know fast from the start type of mode of TGM three. Yeah. Um, I completed it with world rule because it's a little bit easier when you have the um, block delay reset on movement and rotation because you get a little bit extra time, like a tiny bit. It's like a fraction, but that little fraction allows you to slow the game down enough to kind of play it a little bit easier. Yeah. Yeah, um, but classic is so hard. The reaction time that you need at the end is just brutal. Um, you know, if you have control of the game, then you might be playing at like, mm, like three pieces per second. But because the lock delay is so short, if like if you don't have control over it, like if you don't get the piece over where you want it, then stuff will start to pile in the middle really quickly. Yeah, and it can spike up to like four pieces per second, um, or like think for I haven't done the math for a while but it's like it's something where like you really need to keep everything under control and know like really just be 
focused on like where everything's going to go. Yeah. Um, otherwise it'll fall apart. And so I have, you know, I have, um, I have a handful of runs to that like final section where it spikes up to that speed and can't get to the ending. Ooh. Um, so I, w- I want to put it back together, put it in my arcade cabinet, sit down, um, try to get my reaction time back up and be able to complete it. Um, cause that's the one thing I've left in the released TGM games to do oh. to really have everything completed. <laughs> <laughs> um, so that, that I guess would be my 2024 playing goal. Yeah, kind of understand where I already have a max set in NES Tetris, but I have a mode that I can't finish in TGM. That that might be the thing that I go back to next. Yeah. Um, and then I guess in terms of like non playing goals, um, for 2024, um, there's some stuff that I want to do for the um competition cartridge uh, code if I can, um, because there's some stuff that's interesting in terms of um. Um, Josh Tolls uh, had this idea, uh, and I've kind of also like I tried to even bring um, something like that uh, for the after party. Where like, what if you could play the old seeds from the old games, um, yeah. from like previous years? Um, so I, on an EverDrive, I had I had the you know previous years uh, versions of the competition cartridge, which could be like, oh, maybe at an after party we could like you know try out some of the old seeds or whatever. But I think uh, since I only had one copy of that, you know. I think people are, had the gym same sequence up instead, which makes sense. Yeah. Um, but yeah, being able to bring that historic history back in terms of like, if we've changed the competition cart code in a way where like having old versions out there for historical reasons or for people yeah. to play like, oh, like what if we played the Jonas versus JD P sequence oh, that's or cool. um, things like that and or like try to beat their scores like, oh, like I'll try to play, you know, this match and I'm like the third player, you know, like um, Josh Tolles described it like a story mode where you like you pick a player like, I want to play yeah. Jonas's tournament run. I want to play Harry's tournament run. And then you try to play and like play through the bracket at, from that perspective historically and like try to beat those scores to get to the finals. That would be cool. Um, that would be fun. So if we can um, change the current competition cart code in a way where like having older versions of the shuffle code out to, like doesn't like break the security in some way, which I've had yeah. some ideas about how we would like change some stuff where like, oh, like if this thing is also changed, then it's just like not possible without access to the, well, I wouldn't say not possible, like beyond what I think is like computationally possible to know what the P sequences are, unless you have access to the physical cartridge. Yeah. Um, but might not even like have like information leakage anywhere. Like I have some ideas around how we would be able to improve that and like be, feel even more confident, uh, confident about having the old software out there. Um, then that would be cool to do too. Um, and then I guess, um, a related uh, area, I'm also interested in, um, doing some hardware stuff yeah. Um, to be able to produce more competition cartridges um, or things like it. Because um, you mentioned Jim and things like that before. Because um, right now we have the cartridges we have um, and the person that designed the hardware for that, like I don't know if they're interested in being credited for it or if they're interested in producing more or if like if they want to release the schematics for it. Like it's one of those things where like they've They've got their own, you know, life and things going on. Uh, yeah. And like, I don't know if uh, like sometimes they respond to emails when they've got time about, you know, the Tetris side of things. Um, but I haven't gotten an answer about some of these things yet. Um, and that's understandable. But yeah. from another perspective, um, we have a lot of mind share in the community. And also like uh, we, you know, had this cool conversation in the CTM discord where like, I, I don't forget what it was, but I think Hava had this question about like, something game genie related or um you know if you could just get a little bit more oomph out of game genie and then i had this thought of like um how we might be able to patch cartridges in a way that's similar to like the super game genies yeah um with a different hardware design like one that like occurred to me at that moment it's like sometimes you just have these eureka moments like you have all the conversations and all the things that you've had up to that point in time and somebody asks something and you're like i wonder if you could do this by instead of patching it the way the game genie does where it remembers stuff and it looks for information yeah. uh, to decide whether to patch it. Um, what if you're always patching it um, with um, uh, like a logic gate? Um, like there's sometimes uh, there's different ways to like patch like data. And w- the one that came to mind is like, Oh, what if we just like exclusive or any of the data that we're getting from the um, uh, Tetris cartridge board, the original one with Patch data. Like basically, if it's a zero, then leave that bit unchanged. And if it's a one, then flip that bit, which yeah. is a different way of looking at it than, oh, like the game genie approach of like, oh, if we see a read of this address 
and compare it to this byte, like this whole byte, then change it to this byte. It's like a bit by bit way of patching things. I'm like, oh, okay, well, that seems like something where there's exclusive or like hardware gates. Like we could yeah. probably do this. Um, and I even have here, I will pull it out because it's kind of gnarly looking. I have a garage prototype of this thing. Um, oh, that looks great. On my desk right now. It's completely gnarly because I couldn't figure out how to lay yeah. it out on the proto board. So I just yeah. used a bunch of enamel wire, like definitely the most labor of a stupid way to do it. Yeah. But um, it worked. Um, I was able to patch this thing. It's like, okay, well, you know, even if we don't have access to whatever the original CTWC cartridge was, um, you know, we have this, you know, ability to like bounce off each other these ideas and talk about it. And like, I had this idea, like, oh, what if we just exclusive or stuff? Yeah. And then, you know, was talking to Kirava and Eric, and then, you know, Infinite Nest Lives gets roped into the conversation. And it's like, okay, well, yeah, this sounds like this might be feasible. Like, yeah. here's what parts you would need. And then I built it. And it's like, okay, maybe we have a way to do these like legal, you know, super game genie like inside of the you know realm of the copyright law that you know the game genie um case was about with nintendo yeah it's the same sort of thing we're just uh nothing is affixed nothing is supplanting the original cartridges if you can just have a little like device that you put into a cartridge or like put a cartridge into yeah maybe we can have more of these things floating around at regionals or legal gym or whatever it is you know yeah yeah then, then we wouldn't need to rely on Tetris skin, which is basically a fan-made game, so illegal. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, it's it's like it it falls under that realm of like um, a derivative work when you put it on a cartridge. Yeah. Where you're like, I you know, technically like with how copyright and stuff is, you know, you don't. There's somebody who doesn't have to like go out and uh, immediately like say like, hey, you can't do that, um, or like lose the copyright. That's not how it works. So it's not like trademark. Yeah. Um, but, you know, I'm sure that it's one of those things that they keep like may have some understanding of, right? Like, I'm sure that they keep an eye on like the things that exist if you search Tetris and Tetris Gym might be one of those things. So they might yeah. know about it. It's one of those things that, you know, um, at the state it is right now, it's not like people aren't, you know, like, well, for one, it's not like people aren't already buying original NES Tetris cartridges. And also, it's not like those secondhand sales of NES Tetris cartridges are affecting any of the current business plans for um Tetris companies so like maybe yeah. that's just not really on their radar that they like feel like they need to shut that down right now yeah um but it would still be better right like if we had a way to be like oh you already have NES Tetris um well here's a thing that you can add to your NES Tetris to switch it to gym and you can you know toggle it back and forth you can play the original software or you can play the gym version or yeah. if new versions of gym gym come out so like here's how you update it with you know a USB cable or like whatever we're able to figure out right yeah there's a lot of possibilities that we could come up with yeah that would be great I'm really looking forward uh, to all that, and and I mean I'm getting pretty excited if you if you talk about the the playing the seats from the previous CTWC, and then then maybe mm -hmm. I can win CTWC with my <laughs> with my Tetris <laughs> skill. Uh, you you can time travel back to uh, you know 2012 2013 and see like okay do I have the scoring potential to outpace you know those those eras and like it's a practice method too you could like yeah. work your way up through the years <laughs> yeah oh my Alex thank you so much for joining me in the Peace Dependency podcast it was a true pleasure to have you on it was a pleasure talking to you. And with that all being said, this is the end of the Peace Dependency Podcast. Thanks so much for listening. Follow us on the socials at Peace Dependency and myself on the socials at Sir Mesa. Hope you have a great Tetris month and we'll see you all in February. Bye.